Emotions also ran high in Winnipeg as the Argonauts gained a great cup berth. The Eskimos arrived in Vancouver Wednesday with James Bell, their number one source of inspiration. The Eskimos hope Matt Dunnigan will be as effective today as he was in victory over BC. They need a similar effort from Rush and Stu Hill, leader of their defense. The Argonauts took a bus ride on Wednesday that five months ago they did not think they would make this season. But the CFL's Rookie of the Year, Gil Fennerty, led their offense. And Tank Landry solidified their defense. Landry must lead the Argos again today. Bob Obilovich is counting on his defense. Joe Ferragelli relying on his offense. Welcome to the CFL on CBC, your Grey Cup network, coast to coast. Welcome to BC Place in Vancouver. We are just over 25 minutes away from kickoff of the 75th Grey Cup game. Best described as a matchup of the Eskimo offense and the Argonaut defense. And we welcome as our game day coaches too, who to be sure would much rather be coaching their teams in today's game. But as a result of losses last week, Larry Donovan of the BC Lions and Mike Riley of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers settle for the next best thing, and that's to be with us. Mike, you know all about the Argo defense. What advice do you offer the Eskimos today? Well, I think, number one, if they can possibly get the ball down the field, I would uh, would have hoped that we could have had that opportunity a little more, but we didn't quite get the momentum going or the field position. Keep good field position. Be willing to take a single point if you have to, and then try to hit them down the field if you can. Larry, well acquainted you are with the uh, big play Eskimo offense. What would you tell the Argos? Well, first of all, keep the football. Uh, don't give them the football a lot of times because they have a lot of tools, but also at the same time, if you have to punt that football, to the gizmo. That's another part of this game that's going to have to have a lot of attention today. All right, Larry Donovan of the BC Lions, Mike Riley of the Bombers are our game day coaches. Right now, let's hear from Don and Ron. Thank you, Scott. Hi, everybody. There's an old axiom in football that defense wins championships, but Ron, this afternoon, I think the winner will be the team that gets the best quarterbacking. How do you rate the two signal callers? Well, I think in any football game, let alone a Grey Cup game, you have got to get play from the quarterbacks, and we have Matt Dunnigan and Gilbert Renfro. Now, if you're going to control Dunnigan, you better keep him in the pocket because if he's allowed to do this, get through the defense and rush upfield, he's going to cause you an awful lot of problems. This is where you're going to find Gilbert Renfro in the pocket. Now, he says he can run. I don't know about that because of the knee injury. So they are going to know he is in the pocket, and that's where they're going to find him. I think when you talk offensive keys, Brian Kelly is always a key of the Eskimos. It doesn't matter whether you play him in a man-to-man -man defense or a zone defense or double covering. He will find a way to get open and catch passes. Against the zone last week against the Lions, he goes backside, gets an easy touchdown. When you talk about the Argonauts, Gil Fennerty has got to get the ball in his hands today for the Argonauts to win. He's rushed for over 200 yards in the two playoff games. I think he's going to be a big key for the Argonauts. We'll give you an opportunity, Ron, to do some in-depth analysis comparing the various positions and giving a check mark to the team that you think might be best in certain categories. Well, I think the Eskimos have to get the check for the offensive line. Just on experience alone, they've been through a lot together. When you talk the passing game, the best receivers are with the Eskimos. They've got four of them that have played big parts. Running game, although the Eskimos had the biggest offense in the league, I'm giving it to the Argonauts because of penalties 200 yards. Special teams could also play a key role this afternoon. Punt returners extraordinaire, Darnell Clash and Henry Williams. And the men who will look after the kicking games, Lance Chomick and Hank Alisic for the Argos. Cowrick does it all for the Eskimos. How do you compare these two in the special teams category? The kickers give the Argonauts a big, big advantage. I think the punt returners are even, but the Argonauts got the kickers. That takes care of the offense, and Ron Lancaster will be back to look at the defense when the 1987 Grey Cup game coverage continues. Just under 20 minutes away from kickoff in a game many people feel will be determined by the play of the defensive units. In postseason activity, neither defensive squad yielded an offensive touchdown. Can they continue this trait in this Grey Cup game? I think this is going to be an excellent defensive battle. And if we look it up front, the Eskimos with a four-man rush have to rely on these four guys, and Stuart Hill's done it for them all year, particularly in the playoffs. Now, if we flip to the other man, Gerald Bayless, he is the key for the Toronto Argonauts. He will line up on the center. If they don't control Gerald Bayless, 
then Landry, the middle linebacker, is going to have an outstanding game. We look at the two middle linebackers. They play the same position, but they're nowhere near similar in their performance. Danny Bass is the more conventional middle linebacker. Behind the 4-3, you'll find him dropping back in the hook zones, but he controls tackle to tackle, and that's the key of the middle linebacker in the Eskimo scheme. Landry, on the other hand, this is what he likes. He makes things happen. He's all over the field. He's a very emotional football player. He likes to hit people, knock people around. He is the emotional leader of the Toronto Argonauts. Landry definitely plays with enthusiasm, and he provides that passion to the Argo defense that Joe Farragelli talks about so often. Let's see how you compare these two teams defensively with your checklist. Okay, we said the 4-3 of the Eskimos. We've got to give them the check mark because they only rush four people. But when you look at the linebackers with Pless, Landry, and Moan, the edge goes to the Argonauts. I believe today the secondary of the Toronto Argonauts with their bend and don't break attitude and theory is going to do it. In Indian Tangibles, the Eskimos with James Bell, Coach Farragelli in his year in the loss last year. But I believe the Toronto Argonauts are young. They've played well, and they're on a roll, and you don't measure it. Well, the way our expert analyst compares these two teams, there doesn't appear to be much between the Argos and the Edmonton Eskimos as they get set for Grey Cup 87 under the dome here at BC Play Stadium. It should be a great football game. We're looking forward to describing it for you on CBC Television. Here's Scott. Well, Don, to be sure, our game day coaches know these Grey Cup finalists as well as anybody. Mike, the message so far seems to be the Argo defense must be dominant. Uh, is it fair to say that the key to handling the Argo defense is somehow to negate the pressure of their tough front seven? I think that's right. I think if they can move the pocket around a little bit and run the football, you know, really that's, uh, I, I think it'll be very important for Edmonton. They're very capable. Dunnigan's very mobile, of course, and they are very capable of running the ball, and I think that could take a little bit of pressure off of uh, what the Argos are going to do up front. Larry, if you're lucky enough to shut down Kelly, Dunnigan, and, uh, and Stefan Jones, you have to worry about the Eskimos' inside receivers and their running game. Well, first of all, I think the running game's been really understated uh, here. They, their running game uh, two weeks ago was a major concern to us. And going into that football game, Dunnigan always a concern, but that running game, they get that going, that pulls the pass rush off. Okay, gentlemen, you can coach all you want this afternoon and don't have to worry about your players listening to you. Stay with us, and our Grey Cup coverage continues in just a moment. Football fans, introducing the starting lineups. Voici maintenant la présentation des alignements partants. D'abord, l'unité défensive des champions de l'Est, Argonauts de Toronto. First, the defensive team of the Eastern Division champion, Toronto Argonauts. Le numéro 68, number 68, defensive end, allié défensif, Glenn Kolka. Le numéro 70, number 70, defensive end, allié défensif, Dan Sellers. Le numéro 77, number 77, defensive tackle, plaqueur, Rodney Harding. Le numéro 99, number 99, defensive tackle, plaqueur, Gerald Bayless. Le numéro 32, number 32, linebacker, secondeur, Willie Pless. Le numéro 39, number 39, linebacker, secondeur, Bob Landry. Le numéro 36, number 36, linebacker, secondaire, Don Moore. Let's go, let's go. Le numéro 10, number 10, cornerback, demi point, Darnell Clash. Le numéro 2, number 2, quarterback, demi-point, Reggie Pleasant. Let's go, Reggie! Let's go, baby! Le numéro 26, number 26, defensive back, demi-defensive, Selwyn Gray. Let's go, baby! 
Le numéro 13, le petit defensive back, le but défensif, David Daniels. Le numéro 24, le 24, Robert, le maraudeur, Jake Vaughn. From the Western Division champion Edmonton Eskimos, l'alignement partant en attaque des champions de l'Est, de l'Ouest, les Eskimos d'Edmonton. Here is the starting offensive lineup. Le numéro 70, number 70, wide receiver, Eddie Espace, Brian Kelly. Le numéro 31, number 31, slot back, demi inséré, Rick Howes. Le numéro 63, number 63, tackle, le bloqueur, Hector Potier. Le numéro 62, number 62, guard, le garde, Bill Stevenson. Le numéro 67, number 67, center, le centre, Rod Connor. Le numéro 59, number 59, guard, le garde, Leo Blanchard. Le numéro 66, number 66, tackle, le bloqueur, Trevor Bowles. Le numéro 27, number 27, Slovak, demi inséré, Marco Sinker. Number 78, wide receiver, Eddie Espace, Stephen Jones. Le numéro 35, number 35, running back, le demi, Chris Skinner. Official Larry Rohan.
Joining the officials at center field are captains Dan Peroni and Don Moen. Opening of the kickoff, Laura May Laird Cartier, representing Connup, the BC Dan Lions. Bass, Dan Kearns and James Zachary. She was crowned the, the other Eskimos. night as Miss Grey Cup 1987. And she will be participating in the official opening kickoff here at BC Play Stadium. Now, would you like to pick or see or choose an end? Evans, in which end would you like to kick from? Toronto will receive. Toronto Argonauts will be receiving the Edmonton Eskimos kicking off and of course there is no major decision to be made by either team as the weather conditions Moving do not the affect the course of the ball game. To the 75th breakup championship the CFL Commissioner Douglas H. Mitchell joined by former Olympian and member of Canada's Sports Hall of Fame and now Minister of State for Fitness and Amateur Sport the Honorable Otto Jelinek and Miss Grey Cup for 1987, Laura May Laird, escorted by Sergeant Eric Johnson and Constable Bob Underhill from the Burnaby Detachment of the RCMP. Not a bad kickoff by. The Honorable Otto Jelinek, and he didn't even have the advantage of using a kicking tee. Right now, let's bring in Scott and Steve. All right, Don, that takes care of most of the pregame business, and we are just about set to go. Steve Armitage joins us on our Grey Cup telecast today. Steve will be covering the uh, sidelines and uh, getting whatever stories happen at the Argo bench. And, Steve, I know that uh, you are looking forward, like most people, to the best Grey Cup in years. Scott, I'm looking forward to a great game. We've got two outstanding offenses led by two very solid quarterbacks in Matt Dunnigan and Gilbert Renfro, two good defenses. It'll be interesting to see which team gets the fan support. Both were booed. Yeah, a very discriminating crowd here that might only be happy with the Lions in the Grey Cup. Stay with us. We'll be right back on your Grey Cup Network, Coast to Coast. Welcome back to BC Place in Vancouver for CBC's coverage of the 75th Grey Cup game. We're moments away from kickoff, but right now, the national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, here to lead all of Canada in the singing of our national anthem is the Nylons. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, through patriot love, in all thy sons command, with glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free, from far. party leaves the center of the field and the players will now take over and demonstrate their skills in this 1987 Canadian Football League Championship game. Don, I was watching them and the way the players were introduced last year Edmonton was all excited today they were very businesslike. You would expect the Toronto Argonauts to be excited. They're young. They're on the move. On the way up they hope. The Edmonton Eskimos very businesslike. 
for the Toronto Argonauts. This is the first time that they have faced any team other than the BC Lions under the dome. The same cannot be said for the Edmonton Eskimos. Matt Dunnigan doesn't really like to think about last year's Grey Cup game when the Edmonton Eskimos were whipped by the Hamilton Tiger Cats by a score of 39-15. Dunnigan sporting a beard. He decided to let the whiskers grow in mid-October following a game against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. He was determined to get to a Grey Cup game and he said the beard will come off immediately after this afternoon's contest. Joe Farragelli a veteran CFL coach, but in his first Grey Cup game as a head coach. The Edmonton Eskimos preparing to kick off to the Toronto Argonauts to get this championship game underway. Dwight Edwards and Gil Fennedy are back for Jerry Cowrick's kick. There was some concern about Cowrick as to whether he would be able to play this afternoon. We'll tell you more about that just a little later. Dwight Edwards on the kickoff return, a reverse with Daryl Smith, and it does not work as the Argonauts have planned as Smith is tripped up at the 25-yard line by Mark Norman. An eight-yard return as Gilbert Renfro leads the Argonaut offense onto the field. Well, Renfro's been under 50% of his passes most of the season, and especially in the two playoff games. We talked about Fennerty, how important he is. Warren Hudson may be the best blocking back in the CFL. That's what Bob Obilovich says. The receivers, Jeff Smith and Gene Thomas, often ignored, so it's going to come down to Daryl Smith, and this offensive line is going to have a big day. It's tough on that Edmonton front four. Jeff Smith suffered quite a serious elbow injury in warm-up for this game. Fennerty on the first play from scrimmage. Breaks off tackle for almost 10 yards before being stopped by Junior Robinson and Don Wilson. Fennerty, a unanimous choice the other night as the Shenley Rookie of the Year. And I don't recall any Shenley winner ever before being a unanimous pick. Well, there was no doubt going in he was going to win. A unanimous, as you say, Don, very surprising. But we see what they have to do, and that's what they need. Gil Fennerty to have the ball in his hands. He makes a miss. He got almost 10. And it's just a little short of a first down, so it will be second and inches for the Argonauts. The ball just shy of the 35-yard line. Gilbert Renfro, who started the season with the Ottawa Rough Riders, early was traded to the Toronto Argonauts for Cedric Miller. He keeps, he gets the first down. Gilbert Renfro with a game of Renfro missed a good portion of the season because of a knee injury, but as it moved closer to playoff time, there wasn't much doubt that he was going to be the Argos' number one man. Well, these are the guys that come after him. We say they like the four-man rush, and they got four good ones up front. The linebacking crew anchored by Bass with Schaefer and Ruck. Ruck played very well for him. In the secondary, very, very physical bunch back there. And off to Kennedy, a good hole for Kennedy. why he was chosen Rookie of the Year in the Canadian Football League, Gil Fennerty, ripping off a 33-yard gain. Just a draw play. You see the 37 goes through, makes the key block on the linebacker, and Randy Ambrosi has no one to block. What a job by the Argonaut line, and now it comes down to speed, and it's a good thing Benjamin had an angle on him or he would have been gone. What a way to start for Gil Fennerty. First and ten, the ball is at the 39 of the Eskimo. Renfro throwing deep for Smith, and he overthrows him. But Renfro had a lot of time. He received excellent protection from that Toronto offensive line. Well, that's going to be the key today because we talked in our opening, Don, and Renfro, I don't believe, is going to run very much. They're going to find him in the pocket. Second Jeff down. Smith, his receiver, you know, whatever day it was, Wednesday, I think, fell on his turf and got an eight-stitch cut in his arm, but he didn't seem to have any problem. But Renfro's got the strong arm if they give him time. Second and ten. The ball is at the 39-yard line. Smith goes wide to the left. Gene Thomas is split to the right. Renfro for Thomas off his fingertips, and he was being covered by Stanley Blair. 
runner-up to Gilbert Trinity for Rookie of the Year honors. Not surprising that you go after the rookie. I believe you got to go after those young guys, but he met the test. You see the curl pattern. The ball's there. Excellent defense. That right arm comes in front, bats it away. So Lance Chomick, who has really excelled in the field goal department in the final few weeks of the season, will attempt a 46-yard field goal. He hit for six in the final game of the regular season against Winnipeg. He had six more in the semifinal win over Hamilton. This kick is wide. Henry the Gizmo Williams out of the end zone and looking for room down those sidelines, but he runs out of room. He is forced out of bounds by Gil Fennerty. But the Eskimos will get their first offensive series when we return. A number of times this year we have said that Henry Gizmo William of the Esk Williams of the Eskimos believes these uh, CBC Mellon Jackets to be his good luck charm. In the biggest game of the year, you'll play to any superstition. So here was Henry Gizmo Williams arriving at BC Place today, appropriately attired in the Mellon Jacket we gave him last October and looking very sharp, I might add. Don? Well, yesterday, Scott, when we chatted with the Gizmo, he said, if I run another one back for a touchdown, I want all of your jackets. And he said, I intend to have you fellas leave here naked. <laughs> Matt Dunnigan rolling out of there, gets away from the initial pressure, but Gerald Bayless throws him to the turf at the 20-yard line. Do you remember the game Gerald Bayless had against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders back on July 4th? 13 tackles, and he earned Player of the Week honors for that performance. Well, we're going to get a look at him. We said he'll be over the center. Now, they get good containment by Sellers, number 70, and when Dunnigan pulls it down and comes back inside looking for some running room, who's there waiting on him? Number 99, the first hit along with Landry. That's what you got to do to Dunnigan. Get him on the ground. Gerald Bayless with the big play. There is an injured Toronto Argonaut. I believe it is Darnell Clash. And he is up around the 40-yard line and appears to be in considerable pain. Trainer Fred Dunbar is checking with Darnell Flash. We talk about the punt returning skills of the gizmo. Darnell Flash, when wearing the uniform of the BC Lions, was certainly Mr. Excitement here in the Dome. And he provided the Toronto Argonauts with a lot of excitement this year on that punt return team as well. Rick Ryan goes into the ball game, and Jake Vaughn moves to a halfback spot with David Daniels replacing Flash in the corner. Dunnigan slips. He's throwing deep. It's incomplete. Ryan deflected it away. There were four Argo defenders back there. Is that ball seemed to hang? Well, I think when Matt Dunnigan fell down, that's, that's a sort of a timing pattern. He wants to hit Stephen Jones in between the guy that tipped the ball and the cornerback, Reggie Pleasant. But what happened when he jumped up to throw it? Your timing is off. Watch, Matt goes out. He's just going to slip. No one close. Now when he gets up, he can't deliver the ball properly, but he wants to. He knows where it has to go. It has to go to the sidelines. And the Argonauts did what we figured they'd do, is sit real deep. With Darnell Clash on the bench, Jeff Smith is the punt return man for the Argos. He takes it at the 37-yard line, and he goes down at the 44. So that's where the Argos will scrimmage first and 10 after an excellent 52-yard kick by Jerry Cowrick and a 7-yard run back by Jeff Smith. You see that left elbow heavily bandaged as a result of eight stitches from a gash earlier this week. Steve? Don, the story on Darnell Clash is that he has a cramp in his left thigh. He had some very tight protective tape on that thigh, came over to the bench, took it off, but the pain continues for Darnell Clash. They're looking at him now. The Darnell Clash will be hoping that this Toronto offensive unit can stay out there and give him an opportunity to recover. Fennerty picks up about four yards before being stopped by middle linebacker Danny Bass. Well, that's where you're going to find Bass. It's his job, control tackle to tackle. When you put a four-man rush, they know what lanes they're going to. It's up to Bass to fill them. You see Stuart Hill go from the outside. Now Bass has got to find the ball carrier and put him on the ground. You see him shuck off the block of Hudson to make the tackle. Second and six. 
Enfield's pass incomplete. It was well over the head of Daryl Smith. On the sidelines, had Steve Benjamin been able to leap and haul that throw in, he might have gone for a touchdown. So we get another opportunity to watch Henry the Gizmo Williams perform as he'll accept this third down punt from Hank Elisic. I was just watching Daryl Smith talk to Renfro coming off the field. I think Renfro realized it. it was his mistake. It was just a down and out pattern to the sideline. Don't throw it behind him and high. And that's what he, he just shook his head. Yeah, his fault. Hank Elisic looking for his seventh break up ring this afternoon. Five with the Edmonton Eskimos, one with the Toronto Argonauts in 1983. The kick bounces away from Williams. He has to chase it back to the 10-yard line. And then he's hit by Willie Flesk as he got to the 17. 9.40, the time remaining in this still scoreless opening quarter for the Gizmo, a seven-yard return after that 52-yard kick. And Willie Pless, 5'10", 215-pound linebacker, he put a good hit on those, the Gizmo, or he had a lot of running room. Last week against the B.C. Lions, Matt Dunnigan didn't have a high percentage, but he certainly threw for a lot of yards. Those touchdown tosses to Brian Kelly and Stephen Jones early in the ballgame. Nelson Jones to the 20-yard line. That will be a gain of three. Make it second and seven for the Eskimos. Gerald Bayless and Dan Sellers were in on the stop. This Toronto defensive unit has improved tremendously since the midpoint of the season. The addition of people like Kulka, Sellers, Landry certainly solidified that front seven. Especially when you get a guy as aggressive as Landry and then Sellers, you never know where you're going to find him. He's everywhere. Donegan is still trying to struggle, but can't escape Rodney Harding. And again, that Toronto defensive crew comes through to force the Eskimos into a punting situation. What's surprising there? They really dropped those linebackers out of there. They're forcing Dunnigan to throw downfield against the zone. You see Sellers just hanging around looking for the action. What's going to happen? He comes up, gets hold of him, and then gets help from Harding. And again, Dunnigan hits the deck. That's what you have to do. Jerry Cowrick this time will be punting to Darnell Clash, who stands at the 50-yard line of the Toronto Argonauts. And it's a good kick by Cowrick. Clash has to go back to his own 42. He slips, and he won't go any further. 8.25, the time remaining. You're watching the Grey Cup game on CBC, your Grey Cup Network host. A couple of years ago, when he was playing for the BC Lions here at BC Play Stadium, Darnell Clash injured his knee. He's been wearing a brace on that knee ever since. He has taken the brace off and is going back into the football game. The pain has gone. Let's go back to Ron and Doug. And there's no question that the Toronto Argonauts need Darnell Clash in the lineup playing that corner position and also working on those special teams. Yeah, you need him, you know. He does a good job in the corner, but they need that guy back for punt. You know, you know, he can break the game just as Gizmo. First and ten from the 42. Renfro trying to set up the screen to Fennerty, and Craig Schaefer had read that one perfectly. He had penetrated, and had Fennerty made the catch, Schaefer had him wrapped up. Man-to-man -man -man coverage is as tough to screen because you are assigned to him. At number 43, Craig Schaefer's got Fennerty. Wherever Fennerty goes, he's got to be there. So they let Stuart Hill in, try to screen, but 43's waiting on him. A reclamation project for the Edmonton Eskimos this year. Craig Schaefer, who started the season with the Ottawa Rough Riders. Second and 10, the ball at the 42. Paul Pearson takes it out of bounds, and that will be a first down Toronto. Forced out by Ron Howard. Well, it doesn't surprise you that they go to Pearson. He comes up with the big catches when they need him, and let's face it, Smith and Pearson have been the gunners. Thomas has only caught four passes, and Smith hasn't played a lot, but this is the guy that's been here before. Go to him in big games. Same pattern, reverse angle from the other side. You see Stuart Hill trying to apply the pressure. Gilbert Renfro shows you that strong arm. Pearson got a step on Wilson, makes a catch. Pearson in motion, first and ten from the 53, the handoff to Fennerty, and Fennerty will get about four yards. He ripped off that big 33-yarder earlier in the ballgame. Fennerty 
has that quickness and that running motion that Coach Bob Obilovich refers to as causing other people to miss him. Well, a lot of times that can, you don't need a big hole that way. You put a step on a guy and go the other way. He's got excellent quickness, and he always finds a way to get upfield, and that's what they've got to do with him today. Second and six. The ball is up to 53 of the Edmonton Eskimos. No score in the ball game. Renfro with time. Can't find anybody. Now dumps it to Paul Pearson. Larry Ruck stops Pearson, but not before the Canadian slot back picks up another Toronto first down. A lot of confusion on the side of the pattern. His receivers weren't open, and they all started moving in the same direction. And Renfro turned all the way back inside. That's a tough thing to do. Throw into the middle. And he found him, and Pearson again gets him the first down. He first gained national recognition while performing here on the West Coast with the University of British Columbia Thunderbirds. Kennedy cuts it back and will pick up about four more yards before being stopped by Craig Schaefer with help from Danny Bass. What a story Kennedy has been this year. He came to the Argos from the Italian Football League. And Gil the Thrill has provided Toronto fans with a lot of entertainment. Every time I see him down there, I think of the comments where he makes it. He says all he wanted to do was survive the season. He's had his share of injuries over his college career, and he's so happy to have had a whole season behind him now, and he's playing well today. Second and six from the 39. The second time that the Argos have penetrated this deeply. That pass intended for Pearson again, and the Argos were fortunate it was not intercepted. A little bit dangerous. Craig Schaefer was standing out there when he tried to throw to Pearson. He got that big right hand up and tips it in the air. And when the ball's tipped in the air, there's more defensive people than there are offensive. The gizmo will move back behind the goalposts for this field goal attempt by Lance Chomick, his second of the game. And it will come from 46 yards up. That's the same length, but from the hash marks on the far side. His first field goal try came from the near side hash mark. This one is also wide. That's what they're talking about. The point after by Jerry Cowart. And with 5.07 remaining in the opening quarter with that 112-yard return by Williams, Edmonton leads by a converted touchdown. There you go, Gizmo. Webster's Dictionary says the word gizmo is unknown, and the Toronto Argonauts right about now probably wish they had never heard of him. Boy, I'll say that's a great way to start it. Watch the blocks. 28 Howard gets penalty. Stuart Hill makes his block. And they say it's a team game. Look at the escort he's got. Number five, Stanley Blair is lining him up. Okay, he makes his block, and away goes Gizmo. And from here on, it's just a race, and Lance Chomick doesn't have a chance. The Gizmo's got too much speed. He's going to have a complete wardrobe of melon jackets at the rate he's going. Yeah, does mine go next or yours? <laughs> I think he's probably going to ask for both of them. That's the type of excitement he has been providing for football fans all across the country this season with his ability to return kicks and punts. Dwight Edwards from his own 25-yard line. He also has some speed. He had 
some difficulty, however, finding the opening to run through, but did get it back to the 52-yard line, a 27-yard return. Scott? Ron, I just spoke to Gizmo as he was on the bench here, and he said, uh, I told you it was the jacket. I knew it. If I wore it today, it was going to work, and it did. Well, he is convinced that the Mellon jackets are his good luck charm because we have been involved in almost every return for a touchdown that he has had this season. He might insist that we do all of the Edmonton Eskimo games <laughs> next year. Daryl Smith makes the catch at the 39 of the Edmonton Eskimos. The Eskimos had a, a mix-up in the coverage. You could see 28 really running across the field to try to get over there with Daryl Smith. And all of a sudden, he finds the hole in the zone. You see Don Wilson. Wilson gives him a little shove. Now he's going to play the short zone in the flat. And there goes Smith right into the hole. And Ron Howard comes from the other side of the field. But he was a little late getting there. First and 10. The ball is at the 39. This is the third time in this quarter that the Argos have moved this far into Edmonton Eskimo territory. They move a little further with the reception by Gene Thomas taken out of bounds down at the 30-yard line. They have to get Gene Thomas and Jeff Smith the football. Their big receivers all year have been Daryl Smith first, Paul Pearson second. But the wide receivers, they've got to get it to them today. They're going to get single coverage, and you see Stanley Blair one-on-one. -on -one. From the reverse angle, you saw him go out of bounds, one yard short of a first down. They give it to Warren Hudson, and he does get the first down. Larry Ruck was there to make the tackle. Bob Abilovich is facing a seven-point deficit, but he has to be pleased with the way his team has moved the ball in the opening quarter. Yeah, he's got to be a little bit disappointed trailing 7-0. He's moved the football. His offense has done the job. A little bit nickel and dime, run it, make some first downs, try to get some points. Try two field goals, and he's trailing 7-0. First and 10. The ball is at the 27 of the Edmonton Eskimos. Renfro threw it over the head of Daryl Smith and Ron Howard. Had to try and reach back for an interception. And that's the second time that Renfro has thrown the ball not particularly well when looking for Daryl Smith. When he can go straight back in the pocket and set up, he's very accurate. Had he taken a look downfield, Junior Robinson was talking over here to Steve Benjamin because they turned Jeff, Lew Jeff Smith loose right up the seam. And I'm sure we're going to see that play again. Second and 10. The ball is at the 27. 2.56 remaining in this opening quarter. 7-0. The Eskimos lead it. That 112-yard kick return by the Gizmo. Again intended for Daryl Smith. And once again, Renfro's throw is high. Well, we've seen this with him in the first game he came back against the Bombers. His throws were high, you know. And, you know, he's still only in his third game since he's come back. And he needs to play. He's got to get that throw down because he's had receivers open. Well, Obilovich, in that second last game of the season against Winnipeg, clearly stated that his number one quarterback was going to be Gilbert Renfro, and Renfro has started every game since then. You hear the crowd come alive? They miss another field goal. Look who's standing back there. Tomic with his third field goal try. This time it's good. After missing twice from 46 yards out, Chomick puts it through from 34 yards away. And with 2.26 left in this opening quarter, it's a 7-3 ball game. The Eskimos in front. Obilovich's first head coaching experience in a Grey Cup game was in 1982, a losing effort, when he also faced the Edmonton Eskimos. But what a job he has done with the Toronto Argonauts since taking over as head coach the winningest coach in Toronto Argonaut history. Well, there are football fans here from all parts of Canada. Getting here was only half the fun for some because with the problems in air travel these days, returning home might be a little more difficult for some. The party may last a little bit longer than, <laughs> than anticipated. Hank Elisic will be handling the kickoff chore for the Toronto Argonauts. Yes, some <laughs> folks might not be coming back until Christmas. Stephen Jones and the Gizmo are back for this Hank Elisic kickoff. 
They kick it away from the gizmo. And some claim that Jones is even faster. However, he can't escape Doug Landry, who is downfield, restricting the return to 15 yards after a 65-yard kickoff. So far, Toronto's offensive line has done a pretty good job of supplying protection for Gilbert Renfro, while the Toronto Argonauts have been forcing Matt Dunnigan out of there. Well, that's what makes Ovilovich's quote so right for this football game. You've got to protect that quarterback because if he can't operate, you can't win. Penalty flag goes down as Brian Kelly makes the catch. And then Kelly is forced out of bounds by Willie Pless. But there was a penalty flag at the line of scrimmage. Procedure, Edmonton number 70. Brian Kelly. Just conferring there with John Ireland, the referee, as to how he erred in lining up. And he may have been across the line of scrimmage when he lined up. You know, what I thought was funny. You know, I don't know which guy it was, but it, the flag went immediately, and it was Brian Kelly. You know, those wide receivers, it's tough to hear in here, so they're going to have to turn and look in at the football as he's doing. And you see right here, he knew he jumped, and that's all it takes. First and 15 now for the Eskimos. They lead it by a score of 7-3. Quickly inside to Rick House. And he will have a gain of about 11. Don Moan puts him down on the turf. The, Eskim the Eskimos and Argonauts are a little bit different in the way they play offense. We talk about the wide receivers of Kelly and Jones. You must take away from Edmonton. Therefore, they are going to go to House and Sincar. And there are going to be some big plays made inside. He plans on returning to Winnipeg in the offseason and attending the University of Manitoba to get his teaching certificate. We're into the final minute of this opening quarter. Well, there's a penalty flag on the play. A time count violation against the Edmonton Eskimos. You think noise is a problem for Dunnigan and the Eskimos? Noise is a little bit of a problem, plus the style of defense Toronto plays. If you watch them before the ball snap, they're moving all over the place. Sellers, you, they look for Sellers, and sometimes he's in the middle, sometimes he's to the right, he goes to the left, and wherever he lines up, the Eskimos will have a plan of attack for where he is, but he's never there. Well, that was one of Matt Dunnigan's concerns yesterday when we talked with him, trying to determine just where Sellers would be when they lined up. And there's Willie Plus. There's another penalty flag on the play. It was downfield in the vicinity of the 40-yard line. John Ireland will explain it for us. Holding. Toronto number 13, first down. Halfback David Daniels was guilty of the holding call, which wipes out a solid defensive effort by Willie Pless, who came flying through to drop Matt Dunnigan. Yeah, it looked like Dunnigan was going to escape back to his right, and all of a sudden Willie Pless showed you he might be 215 pounds, but he's got great quickness. The Argonauts missed him earlier in the season when he was out with an injury. Ryan Kelly working against Clash. He gets away from him. A gain of 20 yards for Brian Kelly. Well, Matt Dunnigan said he was going to throw the ball quick because if he throws it quick, he doesn't need as much blocking. And when they come at him with a blitz like that, that's an ideal call. And as we sit in our opening, Brian Kelly is tough one-on-one. -on -one. You can't ask Darnell Clash to handle him. Kelly rewriting the CFL pass receiving record statistics this year. First and ten as Dunnigan goes to the outside, being chased by Plus. And forced out of bounds by Plus and Glenn Colton. Doug Landry also came flying into the fray over on the far side. 
going over top of quarterback Matt Dunnigan on the final play of the opening quarter. And now we get the official signal from the field. And you're watching the Grey Cup game on CBC Television, your Grey Cup network, coast to coast. Joe Farragelli, a rookie head coach in a Grey Cup game with his team in front, thanks to the big play, the 112-yard missed field goal return by Henry the Gizmo Williams. Bob Abilovich now a little concerned to start this second quarter in whether or not his troops can contain the scrambling of Matt Dunnigan. Well, that's the key. Uh, that defense has played well. They've played well the last half of the season, and they've played extremely well in a playoff. But this is their test, Matt Dunnigan. Rick House makes the catch for a first down at the 35-yard line. Statistically, in the first quarter, it was all Toronto. Three field goal attempts by Lance Chomick. He was good on only one. And, of course, the big play of that opening quarter, that 112-yard return by Henry the Gizmo Williams. Doug Landry gets to a former collegiate teammate, Matt Dunnigan, for the first sack of the afternoon back at the 41 yard line watch how quick he comes between that center and guard hey he is in the backfield before dunningham has a chance to plant you cannot allow him to run free like that and that's what's made their defense so tough is the quickness that they have they were teammates at louisiana tech matt dunningham said you always knew when doug landry was in the door well i think <laughs> you know when he's on the field i mean he is not shy second and 16 back at the 40 yard line Dunnigan throws the screen to Milson Jones. And Landry comes flying through with help from Dave Daniels to make the tackle at the 29-yard line. No, they'll spot it at the 27. Zone defense. You see Landry dropping out at the top. They all drop deep. Dunnigan sets the screen well. There they go. Connup and Stevenson in front of him. He needed one more block to get that first and 10. It will be third and three. And the Edmonton Eskimos send their field goal unit out. And there is another injured Toronto Argonaut. It appears to be Doug Landry. And Landry may have suffered an arm injury when he came flying through there to try and bring down Milson Jones. Usually when you see that arm hanging and dangling from the shoulder like that, not move much, it's a shoulder. He must have hit somebody pretty good with it. He, they have to hope he's back because he is the inspirational leader out there. He was the final piece of the puzzle, many feel, in putting together that solid front seven that the Toronto Argonauts now have. A 34-yard field goal attempt by Jerry Cowan. It's good. So the Edmonton Eskimos have a seven-point lead with 12.56 still to play in the first half. The Eskimos were concerned about kicker Jerry Cowrie coming into this game. He sprained his ankle in last week's Western Final. Sprained ankles don't usually heal in a week, but adrenaline has done the trick for Cowrie. Let's go to Steve. Scott, the story here at the Argos bench, the injury to Landry. The tank took a shot that penetrated the armor on the right shoulder. The doctors have looked at it and said, it's okay. Well, if it's at all possible, Landry will be back out there. He is a tough competitor and one who has been enjoying the week of festivity leading up to the Grey Cup game. Dwight Edwards still on his feet on the sidelines and finally knocked down by Brian Warren. A 27-yard run back by Dwight Edwards after that 55-yard kickoff. And basically that's what Dwight Edwards is doing now for the Toronto Argonauts working on those special teams. Yeah, he fills in a wide receiver, but we're following Brian Warren, the linebacker who plays rush end sometime. That's a good hit. When you get him on the sideline, he can't know where to go. Lower the boom on him, and that's what Warren did. 
First and ten for the Argos. They are at their own 48-yard line. They trail by seven. Well, 35 remaining in the half. The pitch to Gil Fennerty. And the Eskimos close it off as Larry Ruck was there to help string it out. Well, that's what you do with any play trying to go wide. You don't want them to get, get up there and quit the corner turn. It's up to those guys. String it out, get those secondary people involved. Larry Ruck's there to make the tackle. The ball is at the 49-yard line. Bill Fennerty started the game so strongly with a couple of big runs for the Argos. But that Eskimo defensive unit has adjusted and has contained them since then. Renfro throwing deep down the sideline. Fennerty will go. Well, Don, we talked about if Renfro could get back and get set in the pocket with time to throw. Watch him. He had time. Just lays it on. And the speed, he's on a linebacker. You can't ask Larry Ruck to run with Gil Finnerty, and you see the result. A touchdown. Well executed play. 61 yards for Gil Finnerty. We said that the Eskimos had adjusted to stopping his rushing, but they were unable to control... Fennerty on that 61-yard pass for a touchdown, and Lance Chomick has an opportunity to put the Argos back on equal terms, which he does. It's been a storybook week for Gil Fennerty. A Shenley Award as the country's outstanding rookie, and now as we look from the reverse angle, this 61-yard touchdown to put the Argos back on even terms. Well, you saw Renfro able to get those feet set right on the money. Finnerty went out as a wide receiver, just run straight down the field on Larry Ruck, and as you say, a storybook week for him. He'd love to finish it off in style. Well, so far, this 1987 Grey Cup game has been everything many anticipated it would be. Individual talents coming to the fore. Those of Gil Finnerty, Henry the Gizmo Williams, Tank Landry, Danny Bass, many others. Well, we talked about Stuart Hill. He has to work on Calvin Prunster. Prunster's got to just get him to the outside. He knows the quarterback will step up. That's the ideal block for the tackle. Keep him outside. Well, the last time they played a Grey Cup game here under the dome, the Toronto Argonauts celebrated with a victory over the BC Lions in 1983. I'd like to duplicate that performance in 1987 and claim the Edmonton Eskimos as their victims. The score is tied at 10 as the Toronto Argonauts prepare to kick off. Hank Olissick looking after that assignment. Stephen Jones and the Gizmo are back for the kickoff. Jones will return it. He is brought down at the 31-yard line and after the tackle, some extra pushing and shoving. Blaine Schmidt and David Daniels were there to stop Stephen Jones, a 17-yard run back after a 61-yard kickoff. We saw that time of possession, 4 minutes and 28 seconds for the Eskimos. Once again, they have not solved this Toronto defense yet. Well, last week we said in that Western final over BC, Matt Dunningham did not have a high percentage, but he wasn't bad for distance. I think he'd like to reverse the statistics that he possesses this afternoon. He's four out of five, but doesn't have big yardage. Chris Skinner makes the catch, and Don Moon is right there to bring him down. Don Moon is another who has a big following at the game this afternoon. He, too, a UBC product. Many consider him one of the most underrated linebackers in the entire country. Well, he does his job there. Just sit back, sit back, and allow Dunnigan to throw it underneath and react on the football and make the tackle. That's what he did. The only problem was he only he gave five yards up, but you can't take everything away. Second and five. The ball is at the 36. Little swing pass coming out of the backfield. Chris Skinner will get the first down up to the 46-yard line, stopped by Willie Plus 
and Reggie Pleasant. The key block was made by number 27, Marco Sincar, on that quick screen to the outside. If we get a chance, if we can see 27, will come to the inside on the left of the screen, and he will make the block on the linebacker right there to allow Blanchard to get outside. But Marco Sincar come in and knocked off Landry. First and ten, the ball is at the 46, 10-29, remaining in the half, the score tied at ten. Nelson Jones will get five more. Up to his own 51-yard line, and again, Willie Plass, who seems to be everywhere this afternoon, is there to make the tackle. Well, you know, a lot of times when you have a defense like the Argonauts have that has so much quickness and move the people around, if you run right at them, you have a better chance of gaining yardage. Dunnigan facing another second and five. Hauls it down, he'll run it. To the 45 of the Toronto Argonauts, and that's something Dunnigan does so well. Well, that's what we talked about in the opening, Don. If you keep him contained from the outside, you may open up a seam inside, and he doesn't find anyone open. But look at the big hole that he's, he's able to get through. Now he's going to pick up some blocks downfield. Didn't get too many of them, but he got the first down. First and 10 from the 45. It is intercepted by Darnell Clash, intended for Rick House. 9-13 is the time remaining in the first half. The Argos will have the ball when we come back. Brian Kelly goes down the sidelines to open the area for House, but what's the ball overthrown? Just a little, but that's all it takes. And Darnell Clash being as quickness that he has. He out jumps him, brings it down, and the Argonauts have the ball again. The first turnover of the afternoon. A man. And the Toronto Argonauts have the ball at their own 32-yard line following the Darnell Clash interception. Daryl Smith seemed to be a little confused, and there's movement at the line of scrimmage. John Mandarich advanced prior to the ball being snapped. Procedure or offside. We'll let the officials sort it out. Offside. And it was John Mandarich who moved across that line of scrimmage prior to the ball being snapped. So it is first and five for Toronto. The ball is up at the 37-yard line. 8.53 is the time remaining in this first half. 10-10 the score. Warren Hudson looking for the first down. He appears to have it. Just a trap. Dan Peroni comes from his left guard position across and makes the trap on James Zachary. And that opens up the hole for number 37, Hudson. Gilbert Renfro doesn't have the experience of a Matt Dunnigan, but he has the confidence of his head coach, Bob Obilovich. He had some high praise for Gilbert Renfro earlier this week. He said he felt he has the potential to be another Warren Moon. Well, that's not bad. Sideline pattern for Jeff Smith, and he makes the catch close to another first down. On the shoes of Darnell Clash, a little slogan, and I'm not sure the significance. Right about now, I think there are some Eskimo fans who might not be particularly fond of Darnell Clash following that interception. Well, he's one of the characters in the league, and I think he's good for the league. You know, it says some do, some don't. If you like him, and I like him, I like the way he plays football. Second down, Bill Fennerty gets the first down. He has the Argo touchdown on that 61-yard pass from Gilbert Renfro. Danny Bass and Larry Rocker there to make the tackle. You know, this Toronto offensive line did an outstanding job in the Eastern Division final against the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. It looks as though they picked up right where they left off in Winnipeg. Well, that's what you got to do, you know. And Bob Obilovich has said this is the best offensive line that he has had 
since he's been with the Toronto Argonauts. And you know he won a great cup a few years ago. And I think Peroni and Kunst and Beckstead, they were there, but now they're solid. He's really impressed with their play. Dean Thomas goes wide to the right. Rentro looking to the right, and underneath he picks off Paul Pearson. Thomas going down the sidelines cleared the area, and Pearson came over to make the catch. They put those three receivers out here to the right, and Pearson's the third one in. He just goes out in the flat, and you saw one receiver clear. There goes the other one, and then Pearson finds the open hole. Renfrew reads it properly out to the sideline to Pearson. First and ten. The ball is at the 39 of the Edmonton Eskimos. 6.55 remaining in the half. Draw play with Fennerty. Craig Schaefer brought him down, but not before he picked up another Toronto first down. Well, we said in the opening, if the Argonauts are going to move the football, they've got to get it in Fennerty's hands, whether it's running or passing. He's had a pretty good day. Look at the job of blocking. Then it's just a, what, allow him to do what he does best, and that's run. Schaefer's the last man that had a shot at it. Good lead block on that run by Fennerty by Warren Hudson. And it is first and ten Toronto, the ball at the 28 of the Eskimos. Renfro couldn't find a receiver, tried to run, but Stuart Hill was having none of that. Stuart Hill, the Eskimos rush in, who has enjoyed a brilliant season. Not talking to the media this week, a little miffed that he didn't get a Shenley nomination or All-Star recognition. Well, he play, he's played well in their two playoff games. Renfro didn't like what he sees. He tries to step back up inside. So you should be there. Hill didn't get to the outside. He didn't get any penetration, but he was there to make the tackle if he stepped up. Back at the 31-yard line, it is second and 12 for the Toronto Argonauts. Renfro to Thomas down at the 10th. The thing you have to be impressed about is the amount of time that Renfro had to throw that football. Gene Thomas went down from the right side and broke inside. We're going to get a look at it. You see Stanley Blair got him man-to-man, -man, and he's inside, and he makes the catch. We know they're going to get one-on-one -on -one coverage outside because they're so concerned with Smith and Pearson. But if you can keep finding him like that, you got everything going. A late addition to the Argo lineup from the University of the Pacific. And now it is Gilbert Rent, uh, Fennerty fighting inside the five-yard line, and it will be second and four from the four. Right behind Ambrosi, Prunster, and Beckstad. There goes Fennedy. 69. Dan Peroni's going to try to make the cutoff block to allow him to get all the yardage he can get. But they're getting the job done in pass protection, and they're moving the, uh, the defensive line around. Well, that's something the Argos have to be happy about, the way they have moved the ball in this first half. Second and four, Fennerty again, touchdown! The time remaining in this first half as Gil Fennerty gets his second touchdown. The first on a 61-yard pass reception. The second on this four-yard run. Well, you see him start to the left behind Schultz and Peroni, but he cuts all the way back behind Ambrosi and Prunster. But nevertheless, again, they push that defensive line around, and that's tough to do. Lance Chomick with the point after and the Toronto Argonauts for the first time this afternoon have the lead. You're watching the Grey Cup on CBC Television, your Grey Cup Network, coast to coast. Welcome back to BC Play Stadium in Vancouver. Coming up at halftime, anniversary celebrations. The 75th year of the Grey Cup will have our head coaches, Larry Donovan and Mike uh, Riley. Don and Ron with the first half analysis. And I'll speak with our federal sports minister, Otto Jelinek. I tell you, Don Whitman, a good football game so far here today. A very entertaining football game indeed, Brian. And you know, you talk about Grey Cup recollections of previous years. And the fact that this is... The 75th anniversary, that very first game, 
tickets range from 25 cents to a buck and a quarter. Quite a bit of difference here today, but this is what they came to see. They want to see the ball in the end zone, and Finnerty seems to be getting it done for them today. Two touchdowns for Gill the Thrill. That last touchdown, the result of a turnover. The interception by Darnell Clash. And the Argonauts took advantage and drove it the length of the field for the major score. Tom Richards on the kickoff return. Stopped at the 35-yard line by Warren Hudson. 12-yard return after that 52-yard kickoff. And I think right now Matt Dunnigan has to be just a little concerned with the Eskimo inability to move the football to put together any sustained drives. Well, you said it last week against the BC Lions. He threw for big yardage, long, long passes. Today, the Argonauts are not going to allow him to do that, so he's got to put some drives together. So far, he hasn't done it, and this is the name of the game for the Eskimos. Figure it out. Rick House is the intended receiver. Darnell Clash is heading for the end zone, but they rule an incomplete pass. Well, not all of our Grey Cup viewers today are watching on the North American continent. We'd like to say hello to those viewers at the Canadian Forces Station in Bermuda who are watching live via satellite. They stage their own Grey Cup Day celebration with a dance, a mini Grey Cup game, and conclude the day by watching the game via satellite. And we say hello from BC Place, the site of the 1987 Grey Cup game. Donegan with time, and he picks out Rick House. He slips but he gets the first down. Ron, you talked earlier about the bend but don't break defensive philosophy of the Toronto Argonauts. Perhaps you could expound on that. Well, you got a good example of it there. The Argonauts were sitting so deep that Dunnigan has a lot of time to throw the football, but the Argonauts are just sitting back there. He's looking downfield, looking, finally has to come off. They get those linebackers 15 yards deep. You've got to throw in front of it. And that's why Dunnigan has to be content with a ball control offense today. 3.07, the time remaining till the half. 17-10 is the score. Toronto in front. Donegan flips it out to Chris Skinner. Excellent running by the Bishop's product to get a first down. Stopped by the safety, Jake Vaughn. 2.50 is the time remaining in the first half. Following the game, we will be selecting MVPs in three categories. Offense, defense, and outstanding Canadian. Canada Lease, a Canadian public company providing leadership in the world of high technology and capital equipment leasing. Canada Lease makes your money work better for you. First and ten. The Eskimos at the Toronto 47-yard line. The Eskimos with four Canadian running backs, and they rotate them. Milton Jones, Chris Skinner, Blake Marshall, and Chris Johnstone. Pass knocked down right at the line of scrimmage by Rodney Harding. Gerald Bayless may have forced Dunnigan to throw sooner than he wanted to, and that combination of Bayless and Harding prevented the Eskimos from completing the pass. Well, the Eskimos always like to bring that inside receiver to the inside quick, and then they send Milton Jones this time in the flat, but there it is. Just get up high and knock it down. You see Sellers that time running with the back. And you see the stunt that takes Harding right out into the passing lane. Coming down inside is Bayless. Going outside is Harding. He's the guy that bats it down. Second and 10. Dunnigan loses the football. Doug Landry. He'll score. Surprising speed going down the sidelines, and that is two turnovers now that the Argos have converted into touchdowns. Well, you see Dunning, he pulls it down, tries to escape, and there they are to make the tackle is Culkin, and up comes the ball to Landry, and watch this. 
little move to the outside, and he says, see you later. Well, that's the kind of football player he is. He's going to be around the football, and when it bounces up, he's waiting on it. Dunnigan, the hit on Dunnigan, and the ball drops out, and Landry's right on the spot. Pretty good running back. And he outran Hector Pache as he headed for the end zone and scores a big touchdown for the Toronto Argonauts with 2.20 remaining, and the point after is added by Lance Connick. So after twice facing a seven-point deficit earlier in the ballgame, the Argos now lead by 14. How do you like the stripes on the side of the head of Doug Landry? He and Darnell Class decided to uh, do a little Grey Cup celebrating and wear a bit of identification of their own. He initially was going to throw the ball up into the stands and didn't quite get there. And now Landry keeps it as a souvenir. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of think you keep those as souvenirs. You know, I talked to him the other day here about what kind of season. And, you know, looking back to August, if he ever expected to be in a great cup game, he wasn't even on a roster. And he said it's everything that he could ask. Two of the Edmonton doctors, Dr. Cameron and Dr. Cherry, both conferring with Matt Dunnigan, so perhaps Dunnigan was injured on that hit from Glenn Coca. Well, I think he'll have to sit out. Damon Allen's got his helmet on and has been warmed up. When the doctors are talking to you on the bench that, that soon, and you got to go in the game right away, I don't think he's ready. Tom Richards on the kickoff return. Out to the 40-yard line. No further. Wayne Schmidt was there along with Bruce Elliott. Duncan has time, but we say that Argonaut defense and secondary, they just are everywhere, and when that ball bounces loose, you know, sooner or later one of those linemen are going to get loose. Kolka got there, and he, when he we reached in with that right hand, he batted it out, and when you see the result, Landry's very happy, the Eskimos are sad, and Damon Allen plays quarterback. Damon Allen at quarterback for the Edmonton Eskimos with 2.13 remaining in the half. He was looking for Milson Jones being covered by Rodney Harding. Well, we have talked many times about the improvement in this Toronto football club defensively, the front four and the linebacking crew. There really is no comparison this Toronto team from the midpoint of the season to what we see today. None. And look at this play right here. The momentum has definitely come to the Argonaut side of the field. Harding was out there waiting on that pass. Harding played well for them all year, but when they got called for Landry and Sellers, they've just taken off. Damon Allen won't get a chance to throw as Kulka made the first contact and Sellers finished the job. You know, the bad thing here, Don, if you're an Eskimo fan, is Tom Richards was wide open out at the sideline, but Damon Allen never could get a chance to throw the football. You see, Kulka gets beats his man. Sellers jumps over. Now, Kulka goes by, but he got him off balance enough to where Sellers can finish the job. And as I said, if he'd had just a second, Richards is wide open at the first and ten marker, but no chance. Darnell Glass, the lone man back with his third down kick by Jerry Carrick. And he is taken out of bounds at the 47-yard line by Blake Marshall. Four yards on the return. That's the camera on the other side of BC Play Stadium that has been providing those reverse angle pictures. And on many of the replays that we have had as a result of the reverse angle, we've been able to determine just why a ball was fumbled or why an interception was made. A CBC exclusive we hope you've enjoyed during the course of this 1987 season. Screen pass to Tony Johns and Danny Bass. Read that one perfectly. Well, they had it set well. Well, they got the rush that they wanted. They got the ball to the receiver, but Danny Bass sitting back there just back about four or five yards saw it coming and is right there to make the tackle. All right, you see Bass, number 30. Now, he's looking around. He's seeing something. All right, he finds him. 
seek and destroy. That's what that middle linebacker was supposed to do, and he did it. Pass getting set on second and ten. He drops back to defend. The throw goes deep to Gene Thomas. Incomplete. Stanley Blair was defending against Thomas. Scott? Don, if the Eskimos are going to score any offensive points in the time left in the first half, they'll be engineered by Damon Allen. The Eskimo medical staff does not want Matt Dunnigan to return for any of the first half. He banged his head on the turf when hit by Glenn Kolka. They will re-examine him at halftime. Well, Dunnigan really took a blow there from Kolka as the 6'3", 250-pounder, and bringing him down landed right on top of him. Well, I know that, that's a tough, tough break because when that field is hard and it's artificial turf, there's not much give. Your head hits the ground. You're dazed for a while. Very wise move. Keep them out. Only the second punt of the game by Hank Elizabeth. It's blocked by Stanley Blair. Well, we've had a little bit of everything. We see Elizabeth bobble the snap. And when you bobble the snap, this can happen. What? A little bit low. But it's playable, but as he goes up, look at Blair lay out. I mean, he almost got the foot. That's good defense. He had a mission. He's coming from the outside. Now, normally the ball should be gone, so you don't worry about him. But when you bobble it, it throws the timing off. So now it's a first and ten for the Eskimos from the 39 of the Argos. Stanley Blair blocking that punting attempt by Elisic. And Damon Allen completes it to Milson Jones for a first down and more. One twelve is the time remaining in the first half. 24-10 the score. The Toronto Argonauts in front. But the Eskimos would love to put it in the end zone before going to the dressing room. Well, he looks downfield, finally decides to come to the short man, and then Milton Jones just runs it back inside. They still got a minute left, a lot of time for Damon Allen. First and ten from the 22, drop play with Milton Jones to the five. Well, this game has had absolutely everything you would want in a championship contest. Well, Doug Landry ran out of the middle. He started with the backs when they went in motion, and Milton Jones went right behind his right guard, Leo Blanchard and Trevor Bowles, and he brings it down to the six, 40 seconds. First and goal from the six-yard line, the clock running. Allen, touchdown to... Very opportunistic. Every time the ball is turned over, they put it in the end zone. You see Sincar come right in behind Doug Landry and in front of Jake Bond. And he puts it in the end zone with 28 seconds left. Good, good blocking up front by the Eskimos. And once Sin Carr went behind Landry, it was open. Jerry Cowher gets the point after to bring the Eskimos within seven. Well, this has been quite a spectacle here at BC Place Stadium. 41 points in the first half, 28 seconds remaining. Are you a little surprised? I am. I am in view of the solid defensive efforts of both teams in their respective semifinals, East and West, and in the final, East and West. The lone touchdown that the Toronto Argonauts gave up was as the result of a block kick against Hamilton. The lone touchdown that the Edmonton Eskimos gave up was an interception return against Calgary. Well, you see Allen looking. You see Landry looking to his left. There goes Sinkar right into the open area. But... I was predicting a score somewhere in the 20s. Well, we've already gone by that, but I, I just can't believe it. The defenses are very, very sound. I thought coming into today's game, the question mark was the Toronto Argonaut offense. They've been a little inconsistent, but today they've been right on target, and the uh, Eskimos have had their problems offensively. Marco Sincar's touchdown, bringing the Eskimos within seven with 28 seconds remaining in the first half. 
This crowd at BC Play Stadium has certainly been entertained this afternoon, and we hope you've enjoyed the action wherever you're looking in across the CBC Television Network, your Grey Cup Network from coast to coast. Dwight Edwards again starting out from the 20-yard line. Stop at the 30. Junior Robinson and Craig Schaefer were there to make the tackle. And what has also been interesting through the first half of this game, there have not been many penalty fights. That's good. You know, it's ideal when you let the players decide it on the field. You know, they're not going to take any cheap shots and things like that today. This is for everything that you've worked for since the first day of camp. And it takes good, hard, solid football. And the referees don't have to worry about it. First and ten. The ball is up the 31-yard line. Fennerty picks up about two yards. That takes the clock down to 19 seconds. Dan Mass, the middle linebacker, made the tackle. That late touchdown should give the Edmonton Eskimos a big lift heading into the dressing room. A lot of momentum for him as a football club, but a lot of confidence building for Damon Allen, who came off the bench and in the first series moves the football and puts it in the end zone and brings him within seven. So now he's into the football game. The Eskimos have scored. Should make a great final 30 minutes. This should be the final play of the half. Fennerty cuts back inside, and he is brought down by Craig Schaefer, and time has run out on the scoreboard clock, and there's the signal from the field, and what a half of football it has been in this 1987 Grey Cup game with the Argos leading by seven. time of the 75th Grey Cup game at BC Place in Vancouver and the Argonauts lead the Eskimos 24-17. We are joined by our game day coaches Mike Riley of the Bombers and Larry Dunneman of the BC Lions. Mike if you're coaching the Eskimos are you in the locker room now saying hey for the most part of the first half we did not figure out the Argonaut defense. Well I think uh, Scott really you go in there and say let's just have patience. So uh, we got a big touchdown before halftime we can move the ball on them don't try to do too much too soon have patience don't turn it back over to them. Did that last minute drive prove you can come back in the second half. No doubt about it. I think that was a big, big drive for Edmonton. I think they got to have positive feeling right now. And, uh, you know, it's not going to take that much for them to get another one and get back in it if they don't turn the ball over. That's been the key to the first half, I think. Larry Donovan, if you're coaching the Argos, are you inclined to leave well enough alone as far as your offense goes, which moved the ball very well in the first half? Well, he started out with the run, uh, which I like very much the way that they mixed the run and pass together. Then he went to pass for a while, came back with the combination again. Really looked great. I wouldn't change that. And you want to maintain pressure on Matt Dunnigan. The pressure's been great. It looks like they're leaving a linebacker uh, with his eye on whoever the quarterback might go and then tackle him coming out of the pocket. As impartial observers for a moment, switching from your game day coaches' roles, you are looking at a heck of a ball game, Mike, aren't you? I think it's a great game, and I think uh, it's kind of been for the Argos a classic game for them. They've let Edmonton drive a little bit, but they got some big turnovers, made big plays on defense, and their kicking game's been good. All right, thank you both. As our game day coaches, Mike Riley of the Bombers, Larry Donovan of the BC Lions. As we well, Scott, in that first half, this game provided absolutely everything a football fan could hope for. And Henry the Gizmo Williams, Ron Lancaster, got it started with a brilliant 115-yard return on a missed field goal try. Yeah, the Argonauts move the football very well. Lance Chomick tries two field goals. The first one's wide. He runs it out about 25 yards. But, boy, when he kicked the second one in and missed it, Gizmo got it 112 yards away from the goal line, and the race was on, and it was downhill after that. I think they've officially charted it at 115 yards, and, of course, it is a record on a missed field goal try for Henry the Gizmo Williams of 115 yards. Well, he gets it, starts to his right. He cuts in down inside of Don Moan. Perone can't get him. Now the blocks start happening. A good block by Howard on Finnerty right here. Stuart Hill will make another one for him. And now the entourage there in front of him. And Stanley Blair is going to be the guy that makes the last one right here. He makes it. Now they're going to try to get Lance Chomick. Don Wilson's there. But I don't really believe that Lance Chomick could have run him down anyway. He's just got too much speed. And what a performance. Coming up a little bit later on a second down situation. We talked about Renfro getting set in the pocket. Look, he's set. He throws. He's got Fennerty one-on-one -on, -one on Larry Ruck. Should never be able to cover a guy like Fennerty, and that's what should be the result. 61-yard touchdown for Gil Fennerty. 
one of the interesting swings, three turnovers in the game, and all three have led to touchdowns. The fumble by Matt Dunnigan when he's hit by Glenn Kalka, and Doug the Tank Landry heads for the end zone. Not too much difficulty in outlegging Hector Pache to pay dirt. No, when you saw Kalka's hand come in, that right arm batted it loose, and Pache has no chance on Landry. We said in the opening that Landry liked to run around and make things happen, and he has done that. Damon Allen or Matt Dunnigan in the second half? We don't know right now. Dunnigan was shaken up. And if Damon Allen does come in to start the second half, he may pose some different problems for the Toronto Argonauts defensively. Well, Matt Dunnigan likes to take it easy, throw the ball more. Damon Allen will run. At every opportunity, it's going to be a good one. Right now, let's go to Brian Williams, who is standing by with the Honorable Otto Jelinek. All right, Don Whitman, it has been a good football game, I think better than even you expected so far here today. Oh, no, the CFL has been providing a good product all year, and this is no surprise. It's one of the best uh, football games that we've seen all of North America. Last week on the University Telecast, you said university football in this country has made great strides. If only the CFL could get its act together. What did you mean? I meant that not enough people go out to the games, not enough people watch it on television, even though it is a good product. And when I said they should get their act together, I think there's a need to improve their marketing. It's something like the political arena. You can do good stuff, have good stuff, and people don't know about it. And I think uh, Doug Mitchell and his people are very aware of it and are moving in the right direction. I'll tell you one thing that will sell the Canadian football league better than anything is a game like the fans across the country are seeing here today. Otto, can you open this up for us? Uh, Calgary is the next big event for our nation, the Winter Olympics. These are what? The official uh, coins? These are the commemorative coins. Uh, the government of Canada through the Canadian Mint is selling worldwide in Canada, the Royal Banks and other uh, coin dealers. And the reason, one of the reasons that the Canadian taxpayer will not have to pay anything for the tremendous success in Calgary is because of the sale of these coins. Plus, some of the profit goes to the development of amateur athletes in Canada. So it's a heck of a program, and it's a great Christmas gift, too. Very quickly, as we talk about Calgary, wish you were competing there? Oh, I wish I could compete for Canada every day. It's All right. an honor. Otto Jelinek, our Federal Minister of Sport, enjoying this football game as we are. Right now, let's check in once again with Don Whitman for the first half statistics. Don? Well, Matt Dunnigan, Brian, is warming up at that Edmonton Eskimo bench. He went most of the way in the first half, but it was Damon Allen who engineered that late touchdown drive after Dunnigan was hurt when Glenn Coca fell on him. And on the other side of the field, Gilbert Renfro has gone all the way at quarterback, a 61-yard touchdown strike to Gil Fennerty. And then he engineered another drive following an interception that led to a four-yard touchdown run by Fennerty. Danny Barrett, the backup for this game. There was a lot of speculation earlier in the week whether it would be Barrett or John Congemi as the backup. Bob Obilovich felt that Danny Barrett would be his man. He felt he owed it to Barrett, and he also felt that Barrett would give the Argonauts a little different look if they got into trouble. He said he felt a little bit like a baseball manager trying to rotate his pitchers. He's got three pretty good quarterbacks. They're all young, and they can all play, and only two can, and that's a tough decision. Alisic's kickoff will go out of bounds. No opportunity for Tom Richards to return it, and quite wisely, I think Alisic is kicking it away from Henry the Gizmo Williams. They've tried. Illegal kickoff. Toronto number eight. They've tried lining uh, Richards and Stephen Jones. In this case, now it's Tom Richards, but they have Williams and him line up, pick a side, but wherever Gizmo goes, the ball's gone the other way. Well, I'm a little surprised to see Richards back there. Usually it's Stephen Jones. Now, prior to the game, we were down at the dressing room and saw Jones with a heavily taped leg. Perhaps he has an injury problem that most folks are unaware of. And in that first half, he may have further complicated the problem because he usually is back there to complement number two, the gizmo. Yeah, he's number two in the CFL, so you would expect him to be back there. And, you know, it's an, if he has an injury, we were never notified about it. He's playing on offense. and. I think if you have to make your choice, Tom Richards can do the special teams, but get him out there on offense. Well, the Eskimos have reversed the positions of Richards and Williams. Williams has gone to the right side now, and that's the direction in which the kick is going to go. Williams, a buzz of anticipation through the crowd as he starts on the return, and he barrels up to the 45-yard line, stopped there by Selwyn Drain. He has that great acceleration. He just has to have has to have that wee bit of a hole and he's through it very quickly. Statistically in the first half, the Argos, as the result of that very strong first quarter, 
have a big edge in time of possession and of course they converted both turnovers into major scores. The Toronto Argonauts also gave up the ball once and the Edmonton Eskimos responded with a touchdown of their own. Damon Allen completes the pass to Chris Johnston a block screen that carries down to the 45. Don you can talk about execution all you want but this is about as well as you can do it. I think he fooled everybody in the house. He looked and looked to the left side. Watch Damon Allen. He's got three men to this side. Look at him look. He stopped. He takes a good look. Then when the rush just about gets there, he finds Chris Johnstone. And look at that. Bill Stevenson. He's only played about 13 years. He's out front leading the way. Big play to open the half. Now like Hank Elisic, Bill Stevenson has six Grey Cup rings. His first is 1975. Damon Allen pulls it down, another screen. It was intended for Johnstone again, but he hit Leo Blanchard in the back. Well, you, you, you have to blame that on the receiver. He's got to let the lineman get in front of him. They can't block if they're behind him, but you can see him there setting it up, setting it up here. Now, they take off, and he gets too far in front of them, and he gets in the way of the throw. It's just too bad because it's set again for him. He had blockers. Second and ten. The ball is at the Toronto 45-yard line. We're in the third quarter. The Argos lead it by a score of 24-17. Damon Allen at the controls for the Edmonton Eskimos. <laughs> Kelly makes the catch down at the 20. Well, we talked about him in the pregame show that Brian Kelly will beat a defense if you give him time. And you know... This is a big gamble on a quarterback's part because he threw into coverage. 25-yard game for Kelly, but watch him. I thought for sure he was throwing it up close because Kelly had two people around him. Good hit by Glenn Kulka, but I'll tell you what, when you make the first down, they don't hurt nearly as much. A gain of 25 yards. Jake Vaughn and Selwyn Brain were back, but they couldn't prevent Brian Kelly from making the catch. And there have been a lot of people who haven't been able to stop Brian Kelly from making catches as those statistics will prove. And uh, we have a penalty flag taking too long in putting the ball into play. A time count violation, I think, against the Edmonton Eskimos. Time count violation. Edmonton number nine. I believe that's a crowd problem that time. Just wasn't anticipating. Well, I think Allen tried to change the play at the line of scrimmage when he read the defense. And the wide receivers couldn't hear the call. And that's one of the difficulties teams have under the dome. Takes a while to get used to. You know, the Eskimos play here more than the Argonauts. But when you get as many people that are in here today in a football game, with that noise can find very difficult to hear. Great crowd, though. Well... The Eskimos this year have not won a football game in which they have trailed at halftime. They'd like to change that in this 1987 Grey Cup game. And Damon Allen will try and do it. He hits Stephen Jones. And Jones is limping as he heads back to that huddle. Limping quite a bit, too. So maybe he has got some problem with that hamstring muscle. You know, they gets a, he gets a big catch for him, picks up about 10, 12 yards, but he's going to be three yards short. Reverse angle we're going to look at it. Throw to the wide side of the field. Stephon Jones in front of Reggie Pleasant makes the catch. Can't get that foot planted. Of course he was the big star in the victory over the BC Lions a week ago. Dave Daniels was blitzing from his halfback position and he stopped Chris Johnstone right on his tracks. Well, that's what you call guessing right. He guessed the snap count. Dave Daniels hit it on the run, and he's into the backfield before they have a chance. Watch, Johnstone gets the ball, but look who's there waiting on him. He had no chance at all to go anywhere with that one. That is good defense. A little bit lucky, but it's good defense. So it will be a field goal attempt by Jerry Cowrick from 22 yards up. I count too many guys in the, on the field. And there's a penalty flag, and the man down on the turf writhing in pain is Doug Landry, and it appears as though a hamstring may have tightened up on him, and Glenn Coca also has an injury problem. And neither one of them are hurt. They have 13 men on the field. <laughs> Dan Perone and they were down here hollering at him to get somebody off the field, and when they realized he shouldn't be in there, two of them went down. But, hey, they're going to get get away with it it's just too bad but they weren't hurt 
but I counted them up. I hit 13 because the Argonaut bench was going crazy, so I counted and got the 13. There's still 13 out there if you want to count them. I thought they belonged to the Players Association, not the Actors Guild. <laughs> Well, here comes Kolka off the field. Landry's Landry also going off. off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and one in the end zone. Twelve. They're okay now. One went in, two came out. Well, Jerry Cowrick will be trying the field goal now from 22 yards out. Kick is up, and it is good. So the Eskimos slice into that Toronto Argonaut advantage with 11.47 remaining in the third quarter. Ronnie Lancaster was right. The Argos had too many men on the field. They had 13, so they were ordering two men to go down. They went down, and they weren't penalized for it. A stroke of genius. Scott? Steve, the Eskimos' decision not to start Matt Dunnigan in the second half was not medical. He's been cleared to play, but the Eskimo coaches have elected to stay with Damon Allen, who has momentum going for him right now. Don? Well, that's one of the intangibles that Ron Lancaster talked about prior to the game, the shift of momentum and how one individual could get it going for his respective squad. Dwight Edwards is trying to do it for the Toronto Argonauts as he returns it to the 42-yard line, a 20-yard run back. He's brought down by Chris Johnstone. Gilbert Renfro had hopes this year of being the starting quarterback for the Ottawa Rough Riders. During training camp, he says he became aware that he was going to become expendable. He was more than pleased to land with the Toronto Argonauts. Suffered an injury midway through the season that sidelined him for about six weeks. But there was no question in Bob Ovinovich's mind that he was going to be the number one man. In and out of the arms of Gene Thomas. That was a catchable ball. Boy, he drilled it, didn't he? He looked to his left and he came back and Thomas ran a curl to the inside. And it, it had eyes. I mean, it went over top of the linebackers and into the hole. And as you say, very catchable. Well, Thomas is still down. One of the reasons he may not have been able to hang on to that football as he tried to make the cut to catch the football, he may have injured himself. You can see it just over top the linebackers. They jump. It hits him right in the chest. But he's unable to hang on to the ball. Unfortunate it wasn't intercepted. Thomas is having some difficulty putting any weight on his leg. Eleven twenty-one. the time remaining in the third quarter and a reminder that the awards party of the year the 1987 Gemini Awards honoring television's best will come your way Wednesday December 9th consider yourself invited Well, Thomas is now up and uh, walking off to that Toronto bench. And we'll probably see him back in the lineup. So Dwight Edwards has gone into the wideout position, located by Gene Thomas as a result of that injury. Second and ten. Throwing deep for Daryl Smith. He can't catch up with it. A strong throwing arm. Renfro can fire that ball a mile and a nice throwing motion he just stepped threw the ball normal didn't put anything extra on it and it was a straight deep pattern from the word go Daryl Smith just took off upfield Renfro was going to try to lay it to him but it got too far Henry Williams back to the 20 yard line the crowd anticipating another big return by the gizmo Galisic had his last punt attempt blocked by Stanley Blair. Blair trying to come from the outside again, but this time Galisic gets the kick away. Williams fields it at the 20. He has to reverse his field and is brought down at the 20 yard line by Jake Vaughn. A three yard run back. 
And he ran a long way to get those three yards after a 52-yard kick by Alyssa. He should be tired. Three yards, but he must have run 150. And there is also a penalty call against the Argos' Jake Vaughn, a face mask violation in making the tackle on Henry Williams. The Eskimos had the most potent offense in the CFL, establishing two records this year for points and touchdowns. And they now have it first and 10 at their own 37-yard line with 10-18 remaining in the third quarter. And they trail by a score of 24-20. to Damon Allen continues at quarterback. He fumbles the football, gets it back. Wolf with a chance to throw. Sellers and Polka are there to bring him down, and Pless was standing guard. Well, Damon Allen just coming out from behind center. Here he comes. Comes to his left. Looks like he hit the elbow of Blake Marshall, and the ball bounces free. Very fortunate it bounced back in his hands, and he does another wise thing. Just hang on to it. Take the loss. And let's play another down. Well, it looked as though he was trying, as you said, to fake the handoff to Marshall. Hit Marshall with the ball and had it bounce away from him. And now it is second and 27 back at the 22-yard line. Draw play with Nelson Jones. And Jones gets it out to the 27-yard line where Don Moan is there to make the tackle. Marco Sincar, who scored that touchdown late in the first half for the Eskimos on the pass from Damon Allen, is being treated at that Edmonton Eskimo bench, working on his calf muscles. They may have tightened up. Got a couple of cramps. Pretty warm in here today. It was cold all week watching practice, but it's pretty warm in here today. And, of course, it is warm outside. The sun's shining here on the West Coast. Third down kick by Jerry Cowrick, and Darnell Class goes back to his own 38-yard line. And then he's taken out of bounds by Blake Marshall, who excels on those special teams for the Edmonton Eskimos. 8.54 is the time remaining in the third quarter. Perhaps the best sight in all of Grey Cup week was that of James Bell walking around BC Place with his Edmonton Eskimo teammates. James, do you feel as though you're a source of inspiration for the Eskimos? I hope so. Uh, everything seems to be going really well right now. We just got to get back in the game. And I hope I am a motivating force right now. You want a Grey Cup ring? I got to have one. It's, you know, this is what I've worked for. This is what I got hurt for. And I just hope that they come out on hit, ahead. Thanks, James. Thank you. Don? And if they do get those Grey Cup rings, Joe Farragelli has promised that he'll give his to James Bell. Quarterback draw. First down as Renfro gets inside the 40. Stopped by Junior Robinson. I believe he caught him by surprise. And I know I was not expecting to see Renfro run with a football. And it looks like he's hurt a little bit. That was well executed. He had a lot of room to move. But as we said in the opening, that injury that he suffered in August, that's tough. And, you know, it's tough to come back that fast on artificial turf. May have not been a wise choice for a play. Ian Beckstead threw a good block to get Renfro in the clear. And Renfro is favoring that knee. And it was a similar type of play in which Renfro was hurt. He ran for a first down. I asked him about it the other day, whether or not he could have stepped out of bounds on that particular play rather than take the hit. He said he thought he could have gone all the way for the touchdown. Here, he decides to go down. And then gets those legs twisted as a couple of players roll over the top, one of them being Calvin Brunster. Regardless of how well that knee feels to Gilbert Renfro, it is not 100% medically. And he needs rest on that thing, and it's good to see him playing, but he's going to be much better next year after he's had the offseason. But right now, this is a serious problem for them because he's played pretty darn well today. Well, Danny Barrett gets loose at that Toronto bench. Renfro, I'm sure, is going to stay out there on the field just as long as possible. The medical staff probably saying, stay down, give Barrett more time to warm up. Well, I think he's finished for the day just watching him walk right here. I don't think he'll be back. That's a big blow to the Argonauts, so it's up to Danny Barrett. to the 
reaction of the crowd as Gilbert Renfro comes off. And as Bob Abilovich said, I liken myself to a baseball manager trying to determine who's the best starter, who's going to be the relief man. It looks as though he might have to go with the relief man, Danny Barrett, the rest of the game. Stuart Hill and Danny Bass combined to stop Gil Fennerty. It will be second and ten. We have a big crowd, and when, when Renfro was walking off the field very slowly, the fans were cheering. But what it is, a fan meter up on the uh, uh, screen here, they weren't really cheering because Renfro got hit. hurt. They were trying to put it off the edge. But we see the brace on Gilbert Renfro's right knee. You know, I hope he doesn't have to play the rest of his career with it. Maybe the offseason will get rid of it for him. Barrett trying to run, and Stuart Hill says no. The play is made on there by Danny Bass, number 30. When the quarterback gets outside, the middle linebacker is the guy that has to go contain him, and he got outside, chased him right back into Stuart Hill. But it's a good job of blocking. Watch the block that gets him outside. Here comes Schaefer inside. Now he's home free, but look who's out here. Number 30. Turning back in, Stuart Hill makes the tackle. Good defense. Stuart Hill and his defensive mates doing a good job in containing Danny Barrett. Dan Kearns is the injured Edmonton Eskimo player. Both starting quarterbacks, Matt Dunnigan of the Eskimos and now Gilbert Renfro of the Argonauts, are on the bench. Well, I believe in, uh, in our countdown show, Don, Don, today we talked about it's going to be a physical football game. You got two good football clubs out there. This is about all you can ask for in any game. It's a great game to see. Lance Chomick, who has been good on only one of three field goal tries, will attempt a 50-yarder. Chomick was saying 50 yards in the dome is just about the maximum one he should expect from a field goal try. And he's got it. Chomick reasons that the pressure in the dome doesn't allow the ball to float as it does out of doors. So he feels that 50 yards is just about optimum. Well, it holds, too, with what Pasaglia told us last week. You see, he knows this one's gone. He's in a little English, but he gets in there, so he's happy. He's got it through there. Another day at the office. But Pasaglia says it's harder to kick here because when you get out around 50 yards, if that's the maximum range, if you don't use the proper technique of hitting it and following it through and you try to force it, you won't make it. So maybe 50 yards is about the distance. Been quite a year for Lance Chomick playing in a Grey Cup game. Earlier in the year, he got married twice on the 31st of January in Toronto and then up in Edmonton on the 7th of February. I know. I'm sure it was to the same person. Absolutely. <laughs> That's the third longest field goal in Grey Cup history. Dave Cutler hit a 52-yarder in 1975, and Bob McAreedy hit one of 51 yards in 1976. Tom Richards takes the ball at the 10-yard line. And Richards is brought down at the 28-yard line. Well, for perhaps word on Gilbert Renfro, let's go to Steve Armitage. Don, the word on Renfro is not good. It looks like ligaments in his right leg. They put ice on it. They have a bandage on it now. Renfro appears to be in considerable pain. I don't think he'll be back. Well, Steve Armitage and Scott Oak have certainly been on top of everything this afternoon down on the sidelines. Keeping us advised as to the injury problems that both teams have encountered. Several people went high after that one. Stephen Jones almost got it on the deflection, and then a couple of Toronto defensive backs had a shot at it. And Jones was open. He ran the curl route. You see the ball just not quite high enough. The ball's tipped by Pless. Jones almost has it over top of Pleasant's head, but they threw to the right man. He was open if he could have got it down in there. Second and ten. The ball is at the 27-yard line. Rick House has a first down and more. Jake Vaughn 
Don finally threw him out of bounds at the 43. Well, Don, we talked about the, the way they bend and don't break, but this time they decide to go after Damon Allen and they bring everybody. And when you do that, you have nobody underneath the inside receivers. Watch them. They're coming on the blitz. An excellent job of blocking up front. And when the ball's there, he does it all. Over the top goes Selwyn Drain. A good move right here on Daniels. Now he picks up a good block. Watch it coming. Jones makes the block for him. Jake Vaughn runs him down, but that's a big, big play for the Eskimos. 39 yards the game from Damon Allen to Rick House. First and 10. Good fake by Damon Allen. Get him, get him, get him, get him. And he's brought down by Pleasant inside the 40. Fooled everybody in the house with that fake. But the big thing was that for the Argonauts, they had their zone defense where they're sitting deep. So we're going to see it right from the snap. See him hide that ball. Now he comes out. You can see he's not under any pressure. He's just looking for something to do with it. There's no one open downfield. Does a wise thing. Get what you can. He got almost four. Five minutes. The time remaining in the third quarter. 27-20. The Argonauts lead the Eskimos. Damon Allen stumbled. And then making sure he stays down are linebacker Doug Landry and defensive tackle Gerald Bayless. It's going to come up about two yards short, maybe almost three. All right, straight back. You see Landry sitting in the middle. Now he's reading the quarterback. Wherever the quarterback looks, it's a zone. But he stumbles coming out of there, and he gets pinned by Landry and Bayless. So, oh, another field goal try for the Edmonton Eskimos as Jerry Cowrick will attempt this one from 42 yards out. It's wide. And Darnell Clash will concede the single point. Blake Dermott downfield just to make sure he runs out of the end zone. And with 4.07 remaining in the third quarter, it is 27-21. The oldest and youngest performers in the Grey Cup game, Dan Sellers, the defensive end of the Toronto Argonauts at 22, and veteran Bill Stevenson of the Eskimos, who has won six Grey Cup rings. The first in 1975, and then he was with the Eskimos in their string of five straight. He'd like to make it number seven this afternoon. Kennedy wrapped up almost immediately by James Zachary. Danny Barrett in at quarterback, replacing Gilbert Renfro. And, of course, with Barrett in there, that gives the Toronto Argonauts a little different look. And concern for Bob Obilovich because Barrett, since replacing Renfro, has not had the same type of success in moving the team. We're settling into the defensive ball game. We thought we were going to get it at the start of the game. It was wide open, but both defenses, especially the Eskimos, are coming on. Here comes a halfback, Renfro, Junior Robinson was coming, and he decked Barrett, and Barrett may be hurt. Whoa, I'll tell you what, he had it time perfectly. Junior Robinson just sat back there and he hit the hole on the run and Barrett was stepping that way and he took the hit straight on. Gonna get a good look at it, coming from the left side. Barrett looks to his right, turns, steps the throw, there it is, head right at the chest. Wrap the arm, put him on the ground. Big play by Junior Robinson as he timed that one perfectly. And now Henry Williams is back for Hank Elisic's third down punt. Come on, Hank! Look at this! Williams lets it bounce, but can't cut up the middle as he is surrounded by Bruce Elliott. Don Moan was also there. Over on the Edmonton bench, let's bring in Scotto. Sean, in other games, a hamstring pull might be enough to keep veteran defensive end Dan Kearns out of action, but uh, not in this game. He has his left thigh heavily taped, and although he's on the sidelines now, the Eskimos say that Kearns will go back into this game. Scott, we ask a question. Any word on Stephen Jones as to that injury? No, but I'll check on it for you. At the 30-yard line, 
2.40 remaining in this third quarter, 27-21. Toronto leading. We talked about the injury to Stephen Jones. Well, he didn't look as though he had any problems in making that catch. You know, Don, when he caught that pass that last time when he went back to the huddle, just as he planted his foot to try to keep him going out of bounds, he went over on his ankle a little bit. Those will hurt for a while, but he seems to be running a lot better now. He was limping quite a bit then, but not now. Putting in the big guys, short yardage. Jones has made three catches today for 41 yards. He was the game breaker in the Western Division final against the BC Lions. Short yardage offense. Nelson Jones will get the first down out to about the 41 and a half, maybe the 42, before being stopped by Don Moen. 2.06 remaining in the third quarter. 27-21, the Argonauts lead the Eskimos. Don Southern approaches the secondary, talking to Junior Robinson. He told us they were a physical bunch. We saw an excellent job by a safety man. He doesn't get to do that too often, but he didn't he didn't waste his effort, did he? First down pass attempt. And Allen won't get a chance to throw. He's caught by Rodney Harding, but he was flushed out of there by Glenn Kalka initially. Almost looked to me, Don, like it's a screen pass being set up. Look to the left of your screen. Bill Stevenson hits him, turns him loose, and then leaves. But he couldn't get the ball released because of the pressure. And there's too many white jerseys around there. And Harding just grabs him and holds on. 105 remaining in the third quarter. Second and 14, Edmonton. Allen's going to dump it off to Rick House. First down, Edmonton. Well, Don, we said Rick House and Sincar were going to have big days because you had to pay attention to Kelly and Jones outside. But, boy, is he wide open. A little bit of a play-action fake gets him outside. Looking to Kelly. He's got it all cleared out. Rick House is just going to come in the, right in the middle. Look, no one around him makes the catch. Another big first down to keep the drive alive. On every catch that Rick House has made today, he has been wide open. Boy, he sure has. There's, there's holes in that zone the way Toronto play, and they've got to be to the inside receivers. Draw play with Milton Jones. Down to the 35-yard line. Willie Klaus and Jake Vaughn combined to bring him down. But not before Milton Jones rambled for another Edmonton first down. Good job on the side where you'd expect it. Hector Pottier and Bill Stevenson. You could drive a truck through there. Big job. Now just run. Force him to come back and get you. Willie Pless and Jake Vaughn finally have to pull him down, but the Eskimos are starting to move the football. And this should be the final play of the quarter. First and ten from the 35-yard line. Rick House again. And once again, he's wide open. Yeah, he came in from behind. Came around Willie Pless into the hole and makes the catch. Another big catch. And that is the final play of the third quarter. You're watching Grey Cup 87 on CBC Television. The Grey Cup Network, Coast to Coast. Argo's number one quarterback is still on the bench in pain. I don't think he'll be back in. Danny Barrett is in playing now as the backup. If he gets injured, the Argo putter, Hank Alessic, becomes their third string quarterback. Scott? Steve Dom was asking earlier about Eskimo receiver Stefan Jones. He is okay, and in the game, the Eskimos were more concerned about slot back Marco Sinkar, who suffered cramps, but he also is okay now and in the game. Sinkar goes wide to the left. Ryan Kelly up to the right to start the fourth quarter. First down. Allen drills it to Kelly. Touchdown. Another record for Brian Kelly. He made the catch inside the goal area, was driven out. That, of course, is awarded the touchdown. The point after by Jerry Cowan. And 
the Edmonton Eskimos have regained the lead by a single point. Every time he catches a pass, it seems like it's another record, but boy, he ran a nice pattern, got in over the end zone line, it's over the goal line, as you say. We're going to get a look at it. Damon Allen straight back, got time. Now, when he throws the ball, Brian Kelly will be up in the air. Now, had he landed, he would have landed inside. Watch him. But he even got one foot down as it was anyway. Now we'll get a good look at the pattern Brian Kelly ran. See him studying the defender? All he wants him to do is turn his feet. He turns to the outside. He goes to the inside. Look where he's landed. Excellent catch. Gets that foot down. Touchdown. So the Edmonton Eskimos move in front on the first play of the fourth quarter, 28-27, as Brian Kelly scores the touchdown that puts them ahead. The Edmonton Eskimos and Toronto Argonauts providing tremendous entertainment here at the Dome at BC Place in this 1987 Grey Cup game as Dwight Edwards takes the ball at the 20-yard line. And he's brought down at the 40. The Eskimos have started to take a little bit of control of the football game about halfway through this third quarter. We said something earlier that that front four of the Eskimos had to get into gear, and they have, and then the offense with Damon Allens has started rolling late in the third quarter. Argonauts got to get rolling. Bob Obilovich and Dallas Rainsberger, the head man and the offensive line coach, looking on as Danny Barrett directs the attack from the 40-yard line. One point separating the Argos from the Eskimos. And Barrett hits Daryl Smith. He bounces off one tackle, that of Junior Robinson, and spins to the 45. Threw it right in the hole. Well-grown football. Zone defense by the Eskimos. Daryl Smith just gets by the linebackers into that open area, and Danny Barrett threw it in there. Watch him come off. Now, that's Ron Howard. He gets inside of him. Watch him go by the linebackers. Now, the ball's on the way into the hole. Throw it in the hole. He took the hit this time. Held on. Back to the live action. And Fennerty twists down to the 42. Line of scrimmage had been at the 47-yard line. That's where they ruled that Smith made contact with the turf. And Fennerty gets four. It will be second and six for Rodos. 13-26 remaining in the ballgame. 28-27. The Eskimos lead. Penalty flag goes down as Fennerty is drilled to the turf. The Eskimos were blitzing linebacker Craig Schaefer. I'm anxious to see this call. Offside, Edmonton number 20. The offside call against defensive back Don Wilson. So that will give Toronto a second and one situation. And the ball will be at the Edmonton 38-yard line. You know, it's only a five-yard penalty, but at this stage of the game, it's a big one. Because the Eskimos, as we mentioned, started to take a little bit of control on a second down situation. They'd have had to give it up. Now they'll make the first down. Hudson, big hole inside the 30. He's their power back in short yardage situations, and usually he gets it. 6'2", 215 pounds, starts and they just run to daylight, cuts in behind Dan Peroni, forces Junior Robinson to come up and help Danny Bass make the tackle. First and 10, Toronto at the Eskimo 29-yard line. Hudson again. He drove to about the 25-yard line before being halted by four Eskimo defenders. While we have a moment, a reminder that this program is copyright and is strictly for the private use of our audience. Any reproduction, retransmission, or exhibition in whole or in part without the written consent of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation is strictly prohibited. Second and six, Toronto. Toronto. 
Paul Pearson was the target covered by Don Wilson. It will be third and six, and Lance Chomick will come onto the field to attempt the field goal to put the Argos back in front. Did you see Danny Barrett when he was over the ball pointing to Junior Robinson, the safety man, was only four yards off the line of scrimmage. He had to anticipate a blitz, but Robinson pulled it. He left, and they blitzed the halfback Howard, but they were coming after him. Looks like another cramp for somebody from the Argonauts, Dan Peroni. That's been a continuing problem all game on both sides of the field. Freddie Dunbar out there rubbing the calf muscle of the Eastern Division All-Star. You know, Don, we talk about the Eskimos. We always mention them as a very first-class organization. Yesterday I had a chance to talk to Jeff Volpe, who was a safety man with him in training camp and had to retire from the game of football because of some vertebrae problems in his neck. He's working in the Toronto area. The Eskimos called him and brought him out to spend the week with his football team. Said he really appreciates it. Said he's back playing non-contact hockey and enjoying life. But that's a great thing to do for the Eskimos. Bob Skemp goes into the ball game, taking Peroni's spot on this field goal try by... Lance Chomick. It's good. So the Argos are back in front with 11.40 remaining in the game. Well, prior to the game, we anticipated that both kickers could play a key role, and so far they have. Lance Chomick has hit on three of five, the long one from 50 yards out. And Jerry Cowrick has been good on two of three. His long kick from 34 yards away. You know, you have to be impressed with the job Cowrick's done. You know, he has no experience compared to Tomek and Alyssic, but he's done an excellent job both ways. Damon Allen will run the ball. Fumble. Toronto's got it. Glenn Coca forcing the fumble, and Willie Pless pulled it in. He was looking for Rick House, but Rick House got bumped. He pulls it down to run, and then when he cut back, right here, he's got people behind him, and there it is. The ball's on the ground, and it was number 99, I believe, Gerald Bayless. First and 10, Toronto. They are at the 45. Garrett won't get a chance to throw Stuart Hill brings him down for a loss at the 50. Well, we talked about him before. He's been their leading sacker with 18. And in the playoffs last week, he had three against the Lions. Good pass rush. Four men coming, and he made the sack. Well, you look for your big play people to come through in playoff games. And so far today, the key personnel on both sides have made big plays. That's the way it should be. That's why they're big guys. That's why they're the stars. They have to come up big when you need them. Well over the head of Gene Thomas, who took quite a shot over on the sidelines from Stanley Blair. Well, Stanley Blair really let him have it, didn't he? You can see from up here when Danny Barrett threw the ball, it was too high. Well, the Argos, on two previous turnovers, were able to take advantage and put it in the end zone, but not this time. 10-20 remains in the game. Hank Elisic will stand at his own 45-yard line for this third down kick. This one will bounce, and it looked as though it was going out of bounds, but it stays in the field of play. Junior Robinson picks it up and is brought down almost immediately at the 30-yard line. Not a particularly good kick by Hank Elisic with 9.53 left to play. 
59,478 watching the action inside the Dome and wherever you're looking in this afternoon on CBC Television. We hope you're enjoying the action from the West Coast. I say this afternoon, for those viewers in the East, it is this evening. away from a couple of would-be tacklers and runs it out to the 36 where he can't escape Willie Pless. You know, on that last punt by Hank Elisic, he was trying to angle it out of bounds and he got only 24 yards out of the kick. The Eskimos were first on the board. Then Toronto had a big second quarter. In the second half, the Eskimos have outscored the Argos 11 points to 6 so far. 9.07 is the time remaining. Toronto clinging to a two-point lead. Second down handoff to Milson Jones. Jake Vaughn, the safety, prevented him from going all the way. Don, we saw this play last week. That is a great job of blocking by the left side of the Eskimo line. They pull number 62. Bill Stevenson will pull and come outside and watch the block by Bake Marshall. He blocked Daniels outside, stayed after him, opened the seam for him, and then Milson Jones just used his speed. But a good job by Stevenson and Blake Marshall. First down for Edmonton, the ball at the Toronto 49-yard line. Screen to Chris Johnson. To the 30 of Toronto. Boy, we talked about those Eskimo running backs, the Canadian kids. This time, Chris Johnstone. Now, he's about 6'3", 215 pounds, a well-set-up screen. Right here is where it's made. He cuts back to get in behind the green, green jersey. You see Stevenson, we saw Blanchard, Rick House trying to help there, down to the 35. 7.43 is the time remaining. Nelson Jones brought down by Gerald Bayless after a pickup of a couple. The Eskimos will take those four Canadian running backs, Milson Jones, Chris Johnstone, Chris Skinner, and Blake Marshall. We haven't seen a lot of Blake Marshall today, but the other three have been used a lot. And they, they change off during the game. They don't really have, they have starters, but they don't have regulars. They all play, same as the defensive linemen. Everybody gets a chance. That's good for all the players. They're happy that way. Rick House on the first down. You got to be a little bit impressed by the way Damon Allen's mixing the plays up. Again, Brian Kelly clears it out straight down the field. He looks deep. Rick House goes to the sideline. He throws it away from Jake Bond. House is there to make the catch. But he's mixing the plays well. Screens, runs, outs, and curls. Seven catches today for Rick House for 134 yards. First and 10 Edmonton. They are at the 17-yard line. Damon Allen makes the reverse. He'll run it in. It looks like it's going to be a heck of a collision, but there's the fake. Now, it's run all the way, and he's not about to go out of bounds. He sees the goal line, and you can see a heck of a collision coming. And he slides and gets in. See, a referee gets knocked off. One makes a call, but that's a great effort by Damon Allen. Jerry Cowrick with the point after. Movement at the line of scrimmage as Cowrick puts it through. 6.39 is the time remaining. The Eskimos in front. There was a penalty flag. I think it's going to be offside. Toronto. Offside. Toronto. So the point will stand. And we'll be back 
with the kickoff right after this. Well, they are uh, going to re-kick the convert. It initially looked as though the point was going to stand on an offside call against Toronto. But apparently the whistle had gone before the ball was snapped. So they'll do it all over again. And this time Cowrick puts it through. And it is a 35-30 ball game. And we will return with the Eskimo kickoff right after this. Out. Here's the fake. A little bit of a fake. Now he looks downfield, doesn't like what he sees. And now it's a race to the corner of the end zone. Allen goes down low. The referee signals him in for the touchdown. Well, Damon Allen in a relief role has certainly come through in this 1987 Grey Cup game. Dwight Edwards runs out of room on the sidelines as he returned the kickoff to the 35. A 17-yard run back after a 57-yard kick. <laughs> a beautiful fake by Damon Allen as he ran that one into the end zone, making the reverse and then running it in. Tracy Hand, the third-string quarterback, discussing strategy. First and 10, Toronto from the 34. Gil Fennerty gets it out to the 41. A gain of seven, it will be second and three. 6.09 remaining in the game. 35-30. The Argonauts now trail. Not a bad rushing average, six yards for Gary. Had a great first quarter and a half. For some reason or another, they've gone away from him. Now they're coming back. We've got time. A lot of time. Jeff Smith, wide left. Fennerty again. He gets the first down, and he got that on his own. Well, we go back to that thing we talked about early in the ball game. He makes a miss. He went in, he went out, he dipped, he dipped, he dipped a little bit, and ended up with a first down. Uh, one week from tonight, an all-new movie special brings Ann Shirley back into our lives. Megan Follows headlines a stellar cast in Anne of Green Gables, the sequel. One week from tonight at 7.30, 8 o'clock in Newfoundland on CBC Television, best on the box. First and 10, Toronto. The ball is at the 46-yard line. Screen to Daryl Smith. Oh, he was tripped up by a man flat on his back. It was... Ron Howard, who reached up after being blocked in the play by Chris Schultz. When you keep your slot back in the block, this is a good play. He stays in. He had not much of a block, but that's all he wanted to set the screen. But watch the tackle Ron Howard make. It looks like he's down. He just reaches up. Excellent play because the block was made. Second down, Warren Hudson gets the first down. Had Howard not made that tackle, Daryl Smith, with his speed and with the blockers in front of him, might have gone a long way. Well, he had the blockers out there, and he tried to do what he should do, get over top of it, but Howard got that left hand out and tripped him up. First down, Toronto, there at the Edmonton 53-yard line. 4-12 is the time remaining. What an entertaining breakup game this has been. The Eskimos in front, 35-30. Well, I don't think you really have to describe that. You saw the feelings when he was kneeling on the ground. Boy, he watch him take off. Comes out into the flat. He's got Ron Howard already a step behind him. And as you say, he's got good speed. The ball couldn't be thrown better. Drops it right in there, and he can't hold on. No one feels worse than he does. It will be second and 10, back at the 53-yard line. An opportunity for Daryl Smith to become a Grey Cup hero. Jeff Smith on the sidelines makes the catch. 
Jackson is forced out of bounds by Junior Robinson. He made the catch ducking away from Steve Benjamin. Got one-on-one coverage from the corner. Steve Benjamin, Jeff Smith down the field, break to the sideline. Good balance. Caused him to go right over his back, and then he turned it upfield. Watch the throw. Going to his left. Here comes Benjamin. Right over the top. Smith doesn't have great speed, and he knows it. So he does a wise thing. Step out of bounds. No chance of a fumble. First and 10, Toronto. There at the Eskimo 28-yard line. The screen to Paul Pearson. Well, they haven't screened the slot back too often this season, but they did that time to Paul Pearson. And that's what they're playing for, the newly designed Grey Cup. Won last year by the Hamilton Tiger Cats. The Edmonton Eskimos looking to avenge that loss in this 1987 championship game. And they're 2.59 away from doing just that. 12 well, following the game, we will be selecting MVPs in three categories. Offense, defense, and outstanding Canadians. Canada Lease, a Canadian public company providing leadership in the world of high technology and capital equipment leasing. Canada Lease makes your money work better for you. Well, in a few minutes, one of those dressing rooms, either the Toronto side or the Edmonton side, will be the scene of wild celebration. Here's Barrett, he's gone! inside he saw it all the way that's a great play by Danny Barrett and when he broke the line of scrimmage he knew it and everybody else and there was no way when he was going to touch him somewhat ironical that the play on which the starter Gilbert Renfro was injured produces the go-ahead touchdown for his backup Danny Barrett a uh, great play exactly right a quarterback draw they're going for two they need right now they lead 36 35 one point does them no good Two points, gives him a field goal lead. It's a good call by Bob Obilovich. In his celebration of the touchdown run by Danny Barrett, Obilovich was desperately trying to signal that offensive unit to go for the two points, and the message got through, but it took a little well, too long for Danny Barrett to call the play, but this is the play he called for the go-ahead touchdown. Boy, when that, that tackle was missed by Columbus on the outside, it was all over because you saw Bass and Ruck both going to the right side. Over the middle intended for Paul Pearson, the score will hold. Toronto 36, the Eskimos 35. Well, in a year in which the Canadian Football League has encountered a lot of problems, it started out with the folding of the Montreal Alouettes. It is going out on a high. About all you can ask. A great crowd, 59,400 plus. We said all week it'd be a great football game. We have a lot of people in this country that don't understand what football is all about, that do a lot of talking. But this is unbelievable today. And that man who has been under a lot of pressure throughout the entire year has to be extremely pleased, very satisfied with what he has witnessed today in this championship game. And listen to the reaction of the people inside the dome. It's when it's fun to play football. Get a bunch of people making a lot of noise and you can have a lot of fun. And that's what it's all about. And these two football teams are the two best in the country and there's a one point difference. It's about all you can ask. 2.43, the time remaining. And there is no loser this afternoon. One will celebrate a championship, but the other side can certainly hold its head high. Richard starts from the five-yard line.
and he's taken out of bounds by Selwyn Wayne. Well, with two minutes, 35 seconds, and if we're, if we're right when we say 50 yards is about your limit, he needs about three first downs to get the field goal range or it really isn't going to matter. It's interesting as well. The two quarterbacks, both backups, Damon Allen first running for a touchdown to put his team ahead, and then Danny Barrett running for a major score that has moved the Argos in front. The clock will start with the snap of the ball. 2.36 remaining, the clock running, a pass complete for a first down as Reggie Pleasant makes the tackle and Stephen Jones. Remember a while ago, they tried to throw the same pattern to Stephen Jones. They had Willie Pless in front of it, and it was tipped high. This time, when you don't have anyone under it, you can throw it on the line, and he threw it right in there. Well, a week ago, Stephen Jones was running past B.C. cornerbacks as though they were out there for set decoration. He hasn't had the same success against the Argos, but he did come up with a big catch. Halfback flipped and dumped off on the screen to Milson Jones up to the 50. Doug Landry made a saving tackle at the 50-yard line. David Daniels and Don Moan were blitzing. Yeah, watch this. Jones must, that must be an automatic because here come Daniels and Milson Jones look for a way to get out of there. When he gets out of there, just that little bit of a trip by Landry prevented a big play. Now the ball's in Jones' hand. Here comes Landry. Jones tries to cut in. He trips him up. But he got nine. 158. And the clock is running. The time remaining. Second down play. And Jones should have the first down. He had to get beyond the 51. And it appears he has accomplished that goal. One fifty is the time on the clock, and they're about well for holding true. We're 15 yards from his from 47 for him. That's what he needs. What are the possibilities of overtime? Well, when there's one point, it's a it's a distinct possibility. Now the clock is running. The ball at the 51. First and 10, Edmonton. Kelly wide to the right. Stephen Jones to the left. Allen rolls right. Looks for Kelly over his head. The reason he was high was Dan Sellers coming from the outside. Allen cut in, and then as Sellers came in, he had to go up top whether it got it too high for Brian Kelly. 126, the time left. 36-35, Toronto leads Edmonton. Darnell Clash stood his ground. He just stood there. Kelly made the break off of him, but the ball was too high. Good containment by the Toronto defense. The clock does not start until the ball is snapped. Following that missed pass. Here comes Willie Plus. It's a screen to Milson Jones again. First down to the Toronto 45. What an effort. He was hit about four yards short of the first down and just kept bouncing off. Plus was blitzing. He realized the screen had been set up. He tried to get back in the play, but it was too late. Too late. Two of them came free, Don. Plus, and someone else came from that wide side. Watch him. Here they come. And now, Plus saw it. He tried to detour a run, but watch the effort right here. He bounced off of Don Moan and Landry, took the hit from Daniels, and still made the first down. 117 left. Live action. Draw play with Milson Jones. He is stopped at the 42 by Doug Landry. And you think there are a few butterflies right now in the stomach of Jerry Cowrick as he gets ready because he could be the 1987 Grey Cup hero for the Edmonton Eskimos. And what I like right here, they send in Tom Richard. He comes in. The decision now, do you put it up in the air, gamble on getting a little bit closer, or do you run the football and put it into field goal range? Right now we're looking at a 48-yard field goal if it's tried so that... The, the sign has been given. The play is in there. And now it's up to execution time. Glenn Coca is the injured Toronto Argonaut who has played a standout game. There have been brilliant performances on both sides of the ball by both teams. And selecting the Canada Leafs MVPs, the top offensive player, the top defensive player, and the top Canadian is going to be a top score. I'm glad I'm not doing that today, Don. Yes, the football reporters of Canada have designated one individual from each of the eight league cities 
plus a captain to break a tie in the event there should be a tie to determine who the Canada Leafs MVP winners will be. Wilson Jones, I'm sure, will get some consideration. I, so will Damon Allen. I would say we could name off quite a few. This has been a great football game. You know, you would think with 36-35 score that the defenses haven't played well, but the defenses have done a heck of a job. It's just been a wide open affair, the way you want it. People inside the dome, just under 60,000, have been treated to a whale of a football game this afternoon. This may go down as one of the great Grey Cup games of all time, if not the greatest. It will certainly be one of the great games of all time, perhaps even the greatest spectacle ever witnessed. It's been a shootout. We're into the final minute. The second down play. Allen's pass incomplete. And now, Jerry Cowan will get his chance Field to goal. become a Grey Cup hero. No hesitation at all. Coach Greg Ellis said field goal. Carrick's out there. Take a look at that white tee. They use the white tee, and every week, Wayne Mandruziak, the equipment man, has been with him for a long time, paints an emblem on the white tee. This week, it's the Grey Cup, and they never show it to the kicker until the game. So this is what it's all about. If he puts this one through, that might be what it's all about. A drawing of the Grey Cup on that kicking tee, and the Grey Cup could go to Edmonton if Cowrick is through. He is! Rock, that's all it took. Corey looked very relaxed right there when we saw him, but let's see what he does now. He's got to be happy. Boy, he hit it good, didn't he? Nothing to it. A great kick by Jerry Curran. A 49 yard field goal, and Joe Farragelli shows more emotion <laughs> than did the kicker, Jerry Curran. <laughs> I tell you, that's just to get, that's what the game's all about. Happiness on one side, a little sadness on the other, but what a football game. And I'll tell you another thing, there's 45 seconds left. Don't start celebrating too early because Lance Tomic can kick him a long way. So Jerry Cowan, a graduate of the Windsor Junior Football Program, has put the Edmonton Eskimos in front by two points. 38-36 with 45 seconds remaining. Will Lance Chomick get an opportunity to supplant Jerry Cowrick as Grey Cup hero? He would certainly like the opportunity. Well, you know, I look back there and see Dwight Edwards and Gil Fennedy. Now, Fennedy's done everything else today. We may as well see him return a kickoff to field position to give Chomik that opportunity. 45 seconds. you got a lot of time. They've got to get to about the 41-yard line of the Eskimos. Dwight Edwards takes the kickoff. He still is on his feet, but he's going to lose yards. He's using up a lot of valuable time. He would have been much wiser to go out of bounds because he was almost up to the 40-yard line at one time. He only got 11 yards on the return, but he took the clock down to 31 seconds. 
Well, Blake Marshall's been their gunner on special teams all year. This time, Ruck has a shot at him. Yeah, you're right. Blake should have run out of bounds with it. I tell you, he ran an awful long way. Ended up losing about two yards from this sideline to that one. They still got time to get about 30 yards in about three plays. Barrett to the sidelines, and Gene Thomas was out of bounds. And you know, if you notice how close Stanley Blair was standing there, a lot of times you assume they're going to get deep, and you can throw that down and out pattern to the sidelines and complete it and move up. And, you know, when you stop the clock, no, no, Blair was waiting on it. Good thing it was thrown outside. Well, from the dressing rooms, there are going to be interesting comments about this one. And Steve Armitage will be going to the winner's dressing room right after the game. We invite you to stay with us. High throw. Paul Pearson, the intended receiver, and the Toronto Argonauts are down to their last play. Too high again. Pearson, if the ball's thrown down inside, he's got a chance, but it's too high. You see him chasing Wilson deep, curls around Warren, the linebacker, but he has to jump. And then Wilson comes up. We talk about it being physical. You know he's going to hit you. It's just too high to catch. 23 seconds remain. The Argos must get a first down here or it's all over. They're still alive. No. It's Wilson who comes up with it as he took it away from Paul Pearson. With 16 seconds left, that's the reaction Bob Obilovich will have. An incomplete pass, and the Eskimos take over. Stanley Blair made the hit, and Don Wilson came up with the ball. See, Pearson slides in, slides out. Here comes the hit, as you say. Blair makes it. They roll it incomplete, bring it back to the line of scrimmage, and belongs to the Eskimos. Said he dropped it, and that's, he took the hit, and he dropped it. Well, Danny Barrett, just a couple of moments ago, thought he might be the hero of this anniversary edition of the Grey Cup Classic. Fifteen seconds remain. They hit by Stanley Blair on Paul Pearson, and the ball popped away with Don Wilson recovering. And now the Edmonton Eskimos will be able to take those final seconds off the clock in what some will probably describe as the greatest Grey Cup game ever played. Joe Farragelli, the first time he has been in a Grey Cup game as a head coach, winning this 1987 championship. Damon Allen, the outstanding performer for the Edmonton Eskimos, presenting a fan, perhaps a friend, with the ball. And what a job he did coming on in relief hey, with Matt Dunnigan. I'm behind you. Not a bad comment by Bob Obilovich. The team that had the ball last was going to win. And Obilovich has put together quite a football team in Toronto. A young team, he told us earlier, he feels will be together for a number of years. And they may yet to get the opportunity to sip champagne from the Grey Cup, which the Edmonton Eskimos will be doing. Right now, let's go down to field level and bring in Scott Oates. Don, I am with the hero of the Eskimos' 38-36 victory, the man who kicked the winning goal in the final minute, Jerry Carrick. The oldest question is the most appropriate right now. How do you feel? Great. You know, the team pulled through at the end. They said it might be uh, up to me to kick the last field goal. I wanted to kick the last one, and we did it. <laughs> Now we've got the rings we've been waiting for. What was going through your mind when you stepped up to make the kick? Just uh, fall through and hit it the way I've been hitting the other ones. I thought I got robbed on that one field goal I missed, and I wasn't going to get robbed on this one. Congratulations, Jerry. You were not robbed, and you have a great cup ring to prove it. Thank you very much. Don? 
Well, he didn't show a great deal of emotion when he put that winning field goal through from 49 yards out. But now the Grey Cup is being presented to the champion Edmonton Eskimo. Okay, hold it. Stick. Commissioner Doug Mitchell is there to make the presentation. Congratulations to the Edmonton Eskimos Grey Cup champions for 1987. Well, with that new base on the 1987 Grey Cup, it's not quite as easy to hoist high in the air, but the man who provided the inspiration all season, James Bell. Many thought he would never walk again after that injury here at BC Play Stadium last year in a game against the BC Lions. He has amazed everyone with his recovery, and he provided the motivation and the inspiration to the Edmonton Eskimos. Right now, let's bring in Scott Oak. Don, I'm with the winning quarterback. He is Damon Allen. Damon, a major feature of the Eskimo offense is your ability to step in and do it when Matt Dunnigan can't for whatever reason. And that, I guess we could say, won the game for the Eskimos today. Well, all, all week I was thinking it's going to be my cup. It's going to be our cup. And uh, if Matt couldn't do it, and uh, which he's been, you know, he's been doing a good job all season, you know, if I can step in and when it's crucial time when they really need me, this is the best time to do it. And, uh, and I rose to an occasion. And you know, the help of my offensive of lineman and our team, you know, we wanted it the battle today. Damon, two things. One was the knowledge that you were here last year and felt you were embarrassed by the Hamilton Tiger Cats. The second, the inspiration provided by James Bell. Both were major factors in this victory, weren't they? There's no doubt about it. James Bell came through a recovery that you know a lot of people expected not so fast. And things, uh, you know, he was pumped up and the whole team was pumped up. And you know, I'm just so so glad it's one of my biggest days uh, in my career. You know, and I had Eskimo to, to come through a, a big game like this when it all counts. Thanks, Damon. Enjoyed it. It was one of the greatest great cup games ever played, and you were prominent in it. Thank you very much. Don. So the Edmonton Eskimos will move to the dressing room for their Grey Cup celebration and will be moving there with them when we return to D.C. Clay Stadium for our continuing coverage of Grey Cup 87. There is the scene in the victorious Edmonton Eskimos dressing room, and they should be happy because they are victors in one of the greatest Grey Cup games ever played, 38-36 over the Toronto Argonauts. I am with the inspiration for this victory, James Bell. James, you're on the bench for the Western Final and for the Grey Cup game today. I know you feel very much part of this team, don't you? Oh, definitely. You know, I uh, hope I brought something to the team, you know, as far as inspirational. Uh, you could tell that, you know, the guys' hearts was in it. And uh, this is what, you know, it all comes down to. I got hurt, and, uh, you know, this is my reward right here. I hope to continue to work, you know, with the CFL, and this is what the CFL is all about. You know, I'm really proud right now, and I'd like to say hello to my family. And uh, this is just an exciting feeling. I didn't get to play, but uh, I'm still as much as a part of it as anybody else. And your teammates all say that to a man. James, you've got your Grey Cup ring. You said uh, in the second half to me that you had to have one, and you've got it now. i got to have it. You know, I'm ready for it, and I want my family to know I'm going to have it on there just as big as daylight. And uh, I can hardly wait to start showing it off. This has to be the utmost of my career right now. Congratulations, James, as you share in the Eskimos' Grey Cup victory. Thank you very much. I had a very good time. Don? Well, Scott, James Bell had a very good time on the sidelines watching it. We hope you had a good time watching on television. And the Edmonton Eskimos on Lancaster are having a good time right now in the dressing room. Matt Dunnigan knocked out of the ball game late in the second quarter. Steve Goldman, one of the assistant coaches in the dressing room with him. And as so often happens, a backup comes on in relief and emerges as one of the game stars. And that was the case with Damon Allen. Well, you know, they've talked the two-quarterback system all year, and when Dunnigan can't go, Allen seems to go in and get it done. Uh, you know, you wonder how long this can go on with Matt and Damon because they're both outstanding football players, and there's a lot of teams looking for quarterbacks. So I don't know how long it can go, but for the Eskimos, it's got to be a great feeling to have them both. 
Well, Steve can't. Armitage is standing by down in the dressing room waiting to talk to some of the 1987 Grey Cup champions. And at the moment, they are in a mood of celebration as they enjoy this triumph. And as soon as they get things organized down there, we'll be able to join Steve. But, Ron, as we said in the telecast, the year started off with the demise of the Alouettes, and there were problems throughout the year. But what a way to finish the 1987 season. Well, you know, it's, it's almost like a storybook ending. If you could have drawn it up today and wrote the script, you'd won over 50, 59,000 people in a great football game. That's exactly what the CFL's gotten. They needed it. They got it. The people of Canada will appreciate They've got to appreciate this one if you're a football fan. Well, they simply don't get much better than we saw today with the Edmonton Eskimos winning the Grey Cup with a 38-36 triumph over the Toronto Argonauts. Now let's go down to the dressing room. Ron Hewitt is there to make the presentations. Year, following every telecast, the Canada Leafs' most valuable player has been announced. Today is no exception. With me is Charlie Menkes, the president of Canada Leafs, to make the presentations. Charlie, congratulations. This is our first one. Congratulations. An excellent game. Wonderful game. I'm a Toronto fan, but I have to say you played it. You deserve to win. You deserve to win. City of Champions. The Oilers got theirs, now we got ours. City of Champions. Right on. Congratulations. All right. <laughs> Here's the next one. Charlie, over to our right. One more. Here we are, Nelson. Congratulations. Nelson, congratulations on being the most valuable Canadian on behalf of Canada Leafs. An excellent game. Proud of the Edmonton Eskimos. Here's a check for you from Canada Leafs and a damn good one. And I'm congratulations on the most valuable Canadian player on behalf of Canada Leafs. All right, let's go to the next one. Where is he? Get him up here. Damon Allen. The offensive star, Damon Allen. Damon, there you are. Charlie? Damon Allen, congratulations. I could, I could see the game changing when you came in. You played an excellent game, and you're deserving of the most valuable player, the offensive player of the game. I'd like you to have this check from Canada Lee. It's in that envelope, believe it or not. Right, here's a, and here's a Danby print. Thank you. Hey, we done it, baby! We done it! We done it! Congratulations. I just like to say, uh, can I say some words? I just like to say, uh, you know, we, we worked hard all year and uh, a lot of adversity and uh, we rose to the occasion and when the time came and uh, we done it. It's our cup. It's our cup. It's our cup. Okay, with me now is the head coach of the Edmonton Eskimos, Joe Farragalli. Joe, congratulations on one of the all-time great, great cup games. I, I just thank the Lord I had an opportunity to be part of this game, and, and doubly uh, because we won it. But it was a great football game. I think the Argos played super, our guys played super, and it looked like the, the last guy with the ball was going to win, and we happened to be the last one. Joe, there must have been many times in this contest when you wondered if you were going to pull it off. Well, I, I knew it was going to be tough, but I had faith that we could move the ball and control the game, run some short stuff, and uh, eventually get it in position and score. And I know you want it for a lot of people. <laughs> we are getting a bath here. This is champagne. I guess it is. It's cold, too. <laughs> feels good, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, it does feel good. It feels super. Oh, super. We'll be back with more from Grey Cup 87 on CDG right after this. With me now, a veteran of this Edmonton Eskimo team, Big Bill Stevenson, Grey Cup number seven. You've appeared in eight of them. Is this one the sweetest? Oh, uh, this is awesome. The comeback and being down that many points at halftime and then being able to come back like that. Having Jerry kick that field goal was the greatest rush I've had in a long time, I'll tell you. There were so many ups and downs in this game for you. Was there ever a moment when you doubted you could pull it off? 
Well, I know our offense could get rolling. We had a few problems early in the game there, but uh, once we settled down and started rolling, it felt pretty good. But they kept coming back. You know, they got a heck of an offense. I didn't think they were that good, but they put it, sure put a scare into us. There must have been times when Matt Dunnigan went down and Damon Allen had to come in when you wondered. Uh, when Matt out of there, you know, I guess Matt was a little tight to start with. Damon came in and, and you didn't have all that extra pressure of starting and everything. And just did a heck of a job for us and everything just came together. I don't know what to say. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and congratulations, right Bill Stevenson. Thanks. Super job. Yeah. With me now is Brian Kelly. And Brian has a very special guest with him. Who is this, Brian? Hey, this is first grade cup. Brian, this is my little son. Brian, how does it feel to be in your daddy's arms after a great cup win? Is it nice? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you cheer for your daddy today? Yeah, he's an Eskimo fan. Brian, you and I chatted before the game. You were very low-key, very relaxed. Uh, any tension during the game? Well, when there was a couple minutes left and we had to kick a 50-yard field goal, I was real nervous out there. You came up with a couple of catches today, some record-setting catches. I guess you'll take the Grey Cup over the records. Oh, it, it's, it's just terrific. I'm so proud to be with these Eskimos, and I'm just happy as can be. That was the best dang game I've played in in years. It may be one of the all-time great Grey Cup games. I'd have to agree. It was For the fans, I can't imagine how they could want a better game. Brian, congratulations once again. We'll let you get down there with your son, and we'll get Gizmo in here. He's an honorary CBC commentator. Look at this. Give me the mic. Give me the mic. Okay, it's all yours. Go. Let it go. Let it go. Let me have the mic. Well, how do you feel about the game? I today? feel great. That was a super game. What do you think about the long run Gizmo had? I thought it was one of the greatest missed field goal, touchdown return. Oh, okay. Getting back to the weather for I I want to tell you. I want to tell you. Well, see this. Yeah, I see it. Well, you know, when, uh, Don Wilson was leading the way from me. I almost ran out of gas right here, and I just said, I'm going to land in the end zone. You know, but I want to say hi to my girlfriend, Petra. Don't let it, don't leave yet. Petra, I love you, baby. I'll be home Monday. Ah! Hey, it was the orange jacket that did it, right? It was the orange jacket. Uh, yeah, and Coach Goldie told me, you know, before the game, ah, damn, I'm gonna move, man. he told me before the game, he said, uh, Gizmo, you're going to get a car if you, know, if you be the most valuable player. So he fooled me. I didn't get that, so I'm going to kill him after the game. See you next year, Coach. Okay, Gizmo, from a very happy dressing room, let's go to Scotto. Steve, contrasting emotions over here, to be sure. I'm with the losing coach, Bob Obilovich of the Toronto Argonauts. Bob, it was, as we have said a number of times, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, Grey Cup game ever played. Losing it is pretty tough to take. Well, that's for sure, uh, but I want to congratulate the Edmonton Eskimos. Uh, they made the plays when they had to. It was a great game. Uh, it was one of those games where it was too bad somebody was going to lose it, but uh, we just didn't come up with some points when we should have, and uh, Milson Jones made a real big run when he was stopped to get him in the field goal position, and then Kyler came through. Uh, you know, that was a great kick for a young player like him, and uh, they deserve all the credit for finding a way to win the game. Well, we can say this about the Oregon on season. You were supposed to be in the rebuilding mode, but you decided to start off at the top in the Grey Cup game, and that's quite an accomplishment. Well, I don't feel like our team's losers in any stretch of the imagination. They can be proud of their accomplishments. Uh, this experience is going to make them hungry for next year. Uh, we, I think we've got a good future with this young bunch, and... Uh, it's just unfortunate we couldn't have finished it off the way we would have liked to. There are some good years left for this Argonaut Football Club. You're right about that. Well, we feel good about the people we have right now. And, uh, you know, once we get a little bit more experience, I think we'll be a better football team. All right, Bob Obilovich, thanks for taking the time to talk to us. We appreciate it. Uh, congratulations on a good season and a fine performance in the Great Cup game. Well, our team did a great job. Thank you. To be sure. Thank you, Bob. We'll return to BC Place with more coverage of the 75th Great Cup game in just a moment. With me now in the Eskimos dressing room, the man that everybody wants to talk to, the man who kicked the winning field goal for the Eskimos that gave them the Grey Cup, Jerry Cowery. Jerry, uh, you've had a few minutes now to think about it. Uh, how do you feel now? Great. You know, everyone's been waiting to get that Grey Cup ring on their finger. And there it is, Jerry. Can you talk us through it? Just went out there, tried to be calm, cool, and collective. Uh, hit the ball square. It hooked a little at the end, but it went through, and it's history now. Is it all a case of concentration? I don't think, you know, concentration and keeping keeping calm, keeping calm and cool. And I thought I got robbed on that one field goal I missed, but that field goal doesn't mean anything right now. It was the, the last one that counted, and we're getting our Grey Cup rings, and uh, they can never take that away from me. 
How can you possibly stay calm and cool with so much at stake? I've been through so many training camps and through so many uh, obstacles this year so far. Uh, the first two playoff games, it was just like a, like a, I can't even describe it, you know. It's just The pressure was there in those two games. I pulled through. It was just uh, an apprenticeship, the first two. So. Now tell us a story about the kicking tee. The kicking tee, now that's that's a, one heck of a story. Uh, Dwayne Mandrusiak has been changing it. <laughs> there it is. Uh, Dwayne's been changing it every week uh, since about my third game here. And he had this designed the first week I showed up. And, um, you know, the Grey Cup was just a dream. And, uh, you know, Dwayne had it all ready. When I showed up this, this afternoon to kick, he had it ready for me. And it looked great, just like always. This is really the dream of field goal kicker, is it not to come onto the field and kick the winning field goal for the team that wins the Grey Cup? Um, dream come true, that's for sure, you know. The kicking game here, it was supposed to be a comparison between me and Hank and me and Lance and me and Lou and so far down the line. Um, the team helped me out. Special teams did a heck of a job going down and covering all, all the punts and blocking on the field goals and punts. And uh, you know, it's it's a team effort. I can't just I can't describe how good it feels. And uh, I'm glad I got this one out of the way. Hopefully next year, if we're back, I won't have to kick the game-winning field goal. But if I do, hey, I hopefully I'll be ready for it. Jerry, congratulations once Thank again. Thank you very much. Can okay. I just say hi to a few sure, guys? Yeah. A few of the guys are watching back home at the Offner residence. I'd just like to say hi to them and my mom and dad and my sisters. Thanks. You deserve it. You Thank earned you. it. Thank you. Okay, let's go upstairs to Don and Ron. Thank you, Steve and Ron. I don't think uh, the accomplishment has really sunk in yet for Jerry Carrick. No, not really. Uh, you know, hey, we said, or I said in the pregame show that the special teams goes to the Argonauts because of the experience of Alyssa Kinchomik, and he talks about just going out like another day at the office and kicks a 50-yarder and wins the <laughs> ball game. So, I mean, that's what it's all about, though. And we talked at the start of the telecast about the two solid defensive units. We get 74 points scored, and they run up over 700 yards in offense. But you know what? They still are solid defensive units, both of them. What a great cup game. Won by the Eskimos, 38-36. Our postgame coverage will We'll continue right after this. We're with me now another of the Eskimo veterans who is celebrating his sixth Grey Cup. He has never lost a Grey Cup game. Hector Pache, congratulations, Hector. Thank you very much. It was a great game, wasn't it? Would this be the greatest Grey Cup you've ever played in? I'd say it was the greatest Grey Cup. You know, there's one other game when we were down 21 nothing to Ottawa. That was a, a phenomenal game. But this seven leads back and forth. Oh, it, I was going crazy on the sideline. It was great. It was a great game. How did you keep your composure? We knew we were going to score at the end. We knew we would score. We knew it would come down to in that 50 seconds, you know, whether we would be able to stop them. But our offense, they never stopped us in the second half. They did not stop, you know, us once, I don't believe, on a drive. And, we had no doubt we would score. It was just a matter of the defense coming up big in the end. I asked Jerry Carrick what he was thinking when he tried to kick that field goal. What about you? What was going through your mind? I'm going to kill you if you miss it, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> nice guy. <laughs> oh, I, I, was, hey, I, I felt for the kid because, I mean, you're a rookie. The whole Grey Cup, the whole year, everything's on your shoulders. Let's face it. All they're going to remember is who missed it. And he came through big time. Hector, you've been through some tough times personally. I guess this makes up for it all, does it not? This this goes a long, long way into making up for it. This was great. I mean, I, I'm going crazy inside here. It's Congratulations, awesome. Hector. You. I got a man down here that I want to talk to because it means so much to the Edmonton Eskimos to have Jackie Parker in the dressing room when they win the Grey Cup. Oh, Jackie, was this a game or what? Oh, this was a super game. I was so proud of our guys, and I felt so much for them. And, and, you know, I, I felt that we were going to come back and win the game, and we weren't going to be denied this time. But Toronto played a super game, but our guys got it done when it had to be done. It was just, I, I feel so great for them. I can't explain what I feel. Jackie, were you coaching in this one a little bit on the sidelines today? I, I was I was telling the people next to me how things were coming out, but they weren't coming out like I kept telling them, but they finally did. 
Jackie, was it tough to sit on the sidelines after you uh, resigned as coach and Joe took over? Well, it, it's not. You know, I, I've enjoyed our team this year. They've, uh, you know, they've played well. They've played hard. They've, they've worked at it. They've had one goal in mind. They accomplished that today. Uh, you know, I've enjoyed the season. Uh, you know, I would certainly like to have been spending more time with them and be around them because I really miss them. But uh, the end result is we win the thing today, and that's really all I thought about. Jackie, a lot of the players were playing this one for Jackie Parker. Well, I tell you what, they did a heck of a job for whatever reason, I thought. They just played their hearts out. Congratulations, Thank Jackie. You. Thank you. Okay, right and now with me, Damon Allen getting a hug from Jackie Parker, his former coach. Damon, it's either a dream or a nightmare for a backup quarterback to come off the bench and take over for number one. You turned it into a dream. Well, there's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be able to do the things uh, out there of one for my offensive line, an offensive player that that dig that dig deep for me. You know, and they came through uh, with some big catches and big runs, and there's no doubt about it. I, you know, I'm thrilled. And I'm happy for the Eskimo organization and uh, players on this team because we worked hard, you know, all year long. When you scored that touchdown, I pretty well read run right from the start. I don't think you were going to pass that one. Well, it, the, the play is a fake reverse, and uh, either I pass or run, and there was nobody out there, and uh, and taking a chance of throwing incomplete or or anything else. You know, when the lane is there for me to run, and and you know, I'm just going to take off and try to get it in the end zone. And so, I've been asking everybody if there was a doubt in their mind at some point in this game. Was there ever a time when you thought, "Hey, we're not destined to win this thing"? No, there's no doubt in my mind. I knew we were, we came here to win a football game, and, and we did. And that's the uh, most important thing. Uh, we came here last year, and we didn't win. And this year, uh, we had to have it, and uh, we we got the cup. And this is sweet. There's no difference. It's, it's sweet. Sweet okay. as they come. Damon Allen. Right now, let's go to Scotto. Scott. No, we're going to go upstairs to Ron and Don. All right, Steve. You know, Ron, in a sports commentator's vocabulary, the word great is probably overused, but somehow I can't think of a better one to describe today's Grey Cup game. I agree with you that this was a great football game. It was a great day for the Canadian Football League. 59,000 people saw probably the best game ever played in Grey Cup history. I'm just glad to be part of it. Well, we were glad to have you as part of it during our CBC telecast this season, and we look forward to the 1988 season. Right now, let's go down to field level and our host, Scott Oak. So what was a turbulent CFL season has now ended. To be sure, the CFL has never faced as many crises as it did this year, and it is little wonder the future of the Canadian Football League was called into question. But here is the good news. The CFL is working hard to get its house in order, and the 75th Grey Cup lived up to all its expectations. In fact, provided uh, more excitement than many thought possible. It certainly provided proof that there is a future for the Canadian Football League. We hope you enjoyed our CFL on CBC telecasts as much as we did bringing them to you. We brought some changes to our coverage this year. Inside the CFL and reverse angle replays among them. But none of our changes would have mattered in the least were it not for an improved product on the field. And now we look forward to the road to the 76th Grey Cup beginning next season. In the meantime, number 75 is history now, and the Eskimos have claimed it in a thrilling 38-36 victory over the Toronto Argonauts. Once again, we hope you enjoyed our coverage today and this season as we watched the Toronto Argonauts and the Edmonton Eskimos go all the way. Goodbye from BC.